House Office Building on Capitol Hill. And in just a moment, live coverage of a hearing on combating terrorism being held by the Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats, and International Relations. It's chaired by Congressman Christopher Shays of Connecticut. Ranking member is Dennis Kucinich of Ohio. We will bring you this live at 1 o'clock. It's scheduled to begin. Actually, it's uh, just a couple of minutes late right now, but we will bring it to you live when it gets underway here on C-SPAN. Quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats, and International Relations hearing entitled Combating Terrorism, a Proliferation of Strategies, is called to order. Almost two years before the attacks of September 11, 2001, the advisory panel to assess domestic response capabilities for terrorism involving weapons of mass destruction far more widely and succinctly known as the Gilmore Commission, concluded the United States lacked a coherent, functional national strategy to guide disparate counterterrorism efforts. In testimony before this subcommittee on March 26, 2001, the Commission's Vice Chairman said, quote, a truly comprehensive national strategy will contain a high-level statement of national objectives, coupled logically to a statement of the means used to achieve these objectives, end of quote. The Bush administration inherited a loose collection of presidential directives and law enforcement planning documents used as a strategic framework, but that fragile construct collapsed with the World Trade Center on September 11th. The brutal nature of the terrorist threat shattered naive assumptions terrorists would be deterred by geographic, political, or moral orders. A new strategic paradigm was needed. Containment, deterrence, reaction, and mutually assured destruction no longer served to protect the fundamental security interests of the American people. The threat demands detection, prevention, and a proactive, preemptive approach to self-defense. To meet the demands of a new, more dangerous world, the executive branch has promulgated strategy statements articulating national goals for various aspects of the war on terrorism. Subordinate to the overarching national strat security and military strategies, other plans guide efforts to secure the homeland, combat terrorism abroad, integrate military response capabilities, combat weapons of mass destructions, staunch terrorist funding, secure cyberspace, and protect critical national infrastructure. A strategy famine has given way to a variable feast of high-level statements of national objectives and tactics to defeat the multifaceted foe that is global terrorism. Today, we ask how these strategies link to form the comprehensive national policy recommended by the Gilmore Commission. Are they dynamic enough to meet changing, adaptable threats? 
Do they guide the application of finite resources to achieve critical objectives? And how will we know if they are working? Just as reorganizing the federal government to counter terrorism will take time, reorienting the U.S. long-term strategic mindset will require sustained effort and hard choices. Some fundamental elements of a fully integrated preparedness and response strategy are not yet evident. State officials and local first responders are still waiting to know how much will be expected of them in the event of a major incident. What capabilities in terms of training and equipment should be resonant at the local level? What and how should federal capabilities be brought to bear? To help us begin our consideration of these important questions today, we welcome two panels of distinguished witnesses, including former Governor James Gilmore, Chairman of the Advisory Commission that has been and remains on the forefront of the national debate on combating terrorism. In, the fu in future hearings, we will hear from administrative administration representatives and others to address specific elements of the strategic bulwark against terrorism. We welcome all our witnesses and look forward to their testimony today. And at this point, the chair would recognize our distinguished gentleman, the ranking member, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you and uh, everyone in connect connected with the work of our committee. Thank you. And to let you know that I look forward to working with you in this session. Likewise. Um, as you know, Mr. Chairman, we worked together in the last Congress to conduct oversight over the administration's efforts to secure our country against terrorist attacks. After the awful events of September 11th, it became more evident than ever that we needed a rational approach to protecting the American people. Officials from the U.S. General Accounting Office who are appearing before us again today testified that the number one step in crafting a national strategy was a comprehensive threat and risk assessment. Before we reorganized ourselves or allocated additional funding, we needed to understand and to prioritize the true threats to our nation. Mr. Chairman, on October 15, 2001, you and I joined together and we were accompanied by our counterparts on the full committee, Chairman Waxman, or excuse me, Chairman Burton and Ranking Member Waxman, and the four of us signed a letter to President Bush. We urged the President to conduct exactly this type of assessment. In the spirit of bipartisanship, we moved forward and asked the President to use the opportunity of Governor Ridge's appointment to carefully examine all the threats we face. Unfortunately, President Bush was not responsive in regard to our request. He did not respond to the committee. He, the administration moved ahead with the new Department of Homeland Security and produced a new budget, all without taking the initial step of completing a comprehensive threat, risk, and vulnerability assessment. What is the result of this? Today's hearing is aptly entitled, A Proliferation of Strategies. The administration has been proliferating national security strategies, nearly a dozen by my count, without any logical or demonstrable sense of priorities. The lack of logic and the lack of priorities is exemplified by the administration's push for a preemptive attack on Iraq. The administration has not been able to make any kind of a credible connection between Iraq and al-Qaeda with regard to 9-11. Nor has the administration produced credible evidence connecting Iraq and 9-11. Yet the administration is moving ahead with a preemptive war, despite the fact that Iraq possesses no imminent threat to the United States. Uh, this rush to war in the face of international opposition 
threatens to alienate the United States from the international community at the very moment we need international cooperation to root out terror by pushing our nation and the world to the verge of an historic preemptive attack, we're making America far more dangerous as a place to live. And I would suggest that whatever strategies we're discussing here must take into account the impact of any preemptive action by the United States against Iraq, because it's quite likely that such action, according to reports I've heard, Mr. Chairman, from the FBI uh, that were published in the New York Times, it's quite likely such action could result in more terrorist attacks being directed against this country. So that's why it's important that we have this hearing. This weekend's capture of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the suspected mastermind behind numerous al-Qaeda attacks uh, by Pakistan, uh, the, the capture was effected with the help of Pakistan, once again demonstrates the great importance of international coalitions and cooperation in our ongoing efforts to root out the terrorists. The administration's rush to an historic preemptive war against Iraq, I believe, threatens to isolate our country and alienate allies that we need in our efforts to disrupt, capture, and dismantle the al-Qaeda network. I thank the chair. I thank the gentleman. At this time, the chair would recognize Mr. Janklow, uh, former governor of South Dakota, uh, and then we will recognize Mr. Murphy, uh, member from Pennsylvania. They're both new members, and we're delighted. This is our first hearing. Delighted to uh, welcome both of them. Mr. Tanklo, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And uh, I'm going to be very brief in my comments. As I had an opportunity to review the various strategies that were put forth by staff, I believe there were eight in number. Uh, it becomes really clear, as it's been suggested, that we've had a proliferation of strategies en enunciated, and at the same time, uh, they're interrelated to certain respects, overlapping in certain respects. But what I think we do lack is one clear overall strategy. Now, that's really not surprising. Notwithstanding political comments any of us want to make, this president was president for nine months uh, when the World Trade Center was attacked and we were subjected to the greatest terrorist attack uh, in the history of this country. As a matter of fact, I believe it was the War of 1812 was the last time that America, in a substantive way, had enemy soldiers uh, within our borders uh, operating. But be, be that as it may, uh, this administration inherited no strategic plans at all that occasionally cruise missiles would be launched against some site in Afghanistan, an empty camp, uh, to enunciate some kind of announcement. Uh, but other than that, there really wasn't any a clear, cohesive strategy. But the important thing is, now we have thousands of dead people. We have enormous damage to uh, individuals' lives, survivors' lives. We have trauma, like the likes of which this country has never known before. We have untold damage to our, con our economy, totaling in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And terrorists have figured out they have the ability to bring America virtually to a standstill. Five or six anthrax letters uh, stopped the U.S. Postal Service and for all practical purposes stopped most of the governments in America from being able to function uh, for a period of time. Uh, the airlines were shut down. America's economy, for all practical purposes, were shut down. And so, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to your leadership and working with you and the other members of the Congress, uh, the administration and the American people uh, to do what we can to come up with an overall program uh, laying out the roadmap in very clear, verily enunciated ways, uh, specifically setting forth uh, what it is that, uh, that we're trying to accomplish and the objectives by which we mean to accomplish it. I realize when I say that, it's not unlike a, uh, a playbook for a football game, that uh, you go into the football game with a playbook, and uh, by the time the second play is called and uh, the other team uh, intercepts your ball, your playbook uh, is back to the drawing board for, uh, for modification. Uh, 
but we in this country have about 18,000 law enforcement units that have never before had to work together in an absolutely coordinated way. In my state of South Dakota, which is one of the least sparsely populated states in the union and one of the largest, as I tell people, my congressional district is just uh, slightly smaller than Great Britain in, in terms of size. We have 534 fire departments within the state of South Dakota, uh, over 250 of which are in communities of less than 1,000 people. So we can begin to understand the magnitude on a national scale of what it is that we have to deal with and how we have to address it. And so, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I'm pleased that you've been selected to be our, our chairman uh, with respect to this subcommittee. I look forward to working with you and the others as we move forward to try and get uh, accomplishments done at, at the speed of lightning, uh, I should say at the speed of light, to, uh, to better protect and secure the American people in this country. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll call on uh, Mr. Murphy from Pennsylvania. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I. Uh, First of all, I commend you for calling uh, this hearing. It is very important. If there is anything that the Government Reform Committee should be doing during this time, it's looking at ways of reforming our strategies on national security to make them more efficient, uh, both in local emergency services, as uh, Congressman Janklow just alluded, but also in the state and the national level. We have to be united in our, or in our message, united in our strategy, and then united in our means of implementing that strategy. Uh, during a time when uh, people will, and certainly the terrorists, will look for ways to divide us. They're, they are, of course, counting on our short memory of events, although they should have been burned on our memories forever. Um, they're counting on uh, Americans to be fickle about their memories and counting on us to be divisive in our politics as they watch the news and they mistake freedom of speech for disunity. Uh, there may be times when even this committee and every other committee may have people who do not agree, but uh, I want them to also know a message that as we iron out ways of making these strategies more efficient, as we'll hear from testimony today, these are geared towards working in a united way to take care of these problems quickly and efficiently. So I look forward to the hearings, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we'll call our first panel, and our panel is uh, Mr. Raymond Decker, Director, Defense Capabilities and Management Team, U.S. General Accounting Office accompanied by Stephen Caldwell, Assistant Director of Defense Capabilities and Management. And um, uh, as is our practice, we will ask you gentlemen to stand and we'll swear you in. Just raise your right hand. Thank you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you, gentlemen. Note for the record that our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. I think we only have one statement, that's from you, Mr. Decker, correct? That's and, correct, sir. And uh, just let the record note that, Mr. Decker, we have worked with you uh, for many, many years, and we appreciate very uh, sincerely the, the work of the GAO and uh, uh, specif specifically your work. Uh, thank you very much, and Mr. Caldwell, it's nice to have you here as well. So what we're going to do is I'm going to put the clock on for five and rotate it another five so you have ten. Um, and then we'll go from there. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to participate on this important hearing on national securities relating to, national, to combating terrorism. More than two years ago, in July of 2000, GAO testified before this subcommittee on combating terrorism, the need for a strategy. We had just completed our initial review of the Attorney General's five-year interagency Counterterrorism and Technology Crime Plan, the closest document to a national strategy that time, and commented on its weaknesses. We stated that at the time, there should be only one national strategy to combat terrorism. We indicated that additional planning guidance providing more detailed information for specific functions should be integrated under this one overarching national strategy in a clear hierarchy. At that time, Mr. Chairman, you were sponsoring a bill to establish an office that would, among other duties, coordinate a single integrated strategy. A lot has happened since then. My testimony today is based upon GAO's comprehensive body of work in the area of combating terrorism over the past six years at the request of this subcommittee and others. 
In our past work, we have stressed the importance of a national strategy to combat terrorism, which should serve as a foundation for defining what needs to be accomplished, identifying approaches to achieve desired outcomes, and determining how well the goals are being met. It should not only define the roles and missions of the federal government and agencies, but also those of state and local governments, the private sector, and international community. Finally, a national strategy must incorporate sound management principles, promoting information sharing and coordination in order to guide effective implementation. Sir, I'll focus my comments on two areas, the current national strategies and, and the, their implementation. During the last year or so, the administration has developed and released several new national strategies related to combating terrorism. This constellation of strategies generally supplants a series of presidential directives and the 1998 Attorney General's five-year plan I mentioned earlier. We have identified at least 10 national strategies related to terrorism. Nine of the 10 are approximately 14 months or younger, three are less than a month old. As you can see from the chart on my right, which is also on page 11 of your statement, the written statement, we've attempted to portray the complex relationships among these various strategies based on our review of the strategies and discussions with the executive branch members. Please note that the national drug control strategy isn't shown on the chart since its relationship with combating terrorism is mentioned only in one or two areas within that strategy. Also, we are unaware of any national intelligence strategy to combat terrorism tailored to support all of the strategies, although we recognize intelligence and related activities as crucial for their success. Overall, the strategies do generally form a national framework for combating terrorism. Collectively, they provide goals and objectives on broad issues of national security and how combating terrorism and homeland security fit into a larger realm. In addition, they offer more detailed goals and objectives in specific functional areas to include military operations, weapons of mass destruction, money laundering, cyber security, and the protection of physical infrastructure. Although we have not fully evaluated whether the framework these strategies form is cohesive and comprehensive, there are some positive indications. The strategies are organized in a general hierarchy. Some share themes and some explicitly refer to other strategies. They are more comprehensive in breadth, coverage, and actions needed to combat terrorism than the Attorney General five-year plan. And consistent with our earlier re recommendations, the strategies include not just the family, but federal, but state, local, private, and international partners. Since the administration has not adopted a single overarching national strategy to combat terrorism and has stated that the national security strategy and the national homeland security strategy are mutually supporting documents, it's difficult to ascertain the real hierarchy within this framework that may complicate implementation plans. For example, since different federal agencies have a role in many of these strategies, some confusion in setting priorities and developing coordination mechanisms may exist without a clear understanding of how the strategies are integrated within a tiered framework. Therefore, we believe that a better defined hierarchy among the various strategies is needed. One approach to better explain the precedence and the interrelationships of the strategies might be with a basic pyramid configuration. Although some blocks might be of different shape and size, a pyramid depiction is somewhat easier to understand for all participants. For example, might the national security strategy of the United States occupy the topmost position on the pyramid, and perhaps the national homeland security strategy and, and national strategy to combat terrorism sharing a tier below? Mr. Chairman, allow me to briefly comment on implementation. These national strategies, individually or collectively, no matter how well crafted, will not prevent terrorism. However, these documents, when implemented through intergovernmental, interagency, and international programs that are seamlessly integrated, effectively coordinated, appropriately resourced, and smartly led, will make the difference in the war on terrorism. 
While these strategies must direct and guide programs, it should be noted that these strategies reflect a host of pre-existing initiatives that must be reviewed to ensure proper focus and alignment with new established goals, object objectives, and actions. A critical element for successful implementation is the need for clearly defined roles and responsibilities for all players. If the federal, state, local, private, and international participants have a thorough understanding of the roles, responsibilities, and capabilities of all involved, then coordination through established mechanisms is greatly facilitated. Finally, leaders at all levels must ensure that the implementation process is effectively and efficiently carried out to achieve goals and objectives within the timeline set. Using essentially tools like, central tools like risk management to guide decision making and performance indicators to gauge progress, leaders will be able to better focus attention and adjust resources to move, closer, move the goals closer to end states. Due to the serious consequences of failure, GAO has designated the implementation of Homeland Security as a high-risk federal area. And this is a product that clearly delineates that challenge. Sir, the leadership challenge is daunting but not impossible. In closing, we believe the framework formed by these strategies, if effectively implemented with the full involvement and commitment of all partners, will result in significant progress towards our stated goals in the war of terrorism. Congress will play an increasingly important role in addressing the challenges faced in this process. In addition to recently passed legislation reorganizing the federal government to combat terrorism and the appropriation of significant funds to support the war on terrorism, Congress will need to provide keen oversight through hearings like today to ensure all programs are well designed, developed, and executed to accomplish the national goals. Our success on terrorism depends on the leadership and actions of the federal government and its domestic and international partners. So this concludes my prepared statement, and we'll be pleased to respond to any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Decker. Uh, just for the benefit of, of new members, here and first, let me um, welcome uh, Congressman Chris Bell from Texas, uh, a new member to the committee. We're delighted you're a member of this committee. I, I think you'll find the work of this committee um, quite meaningful and helpful to your district and our country. Uh, at this time, Mr. Bell, I would be uh, happy to recognize if you'd like to just make an, an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I very much appreciate the, the opportunity to, to serve with you uh, on this committee, and I thank you for calling this hearing on uh, what has obviously become uh, one of our nation's top priorities, uh, finding a way to combat terrorism and securing the homeland. And I would like to uh, thank Mr. Decker and the others uh, who will be testifying here today and have offered themselves to uh, answer our questions. I, I have some questions about the plan, but I will hold off on those for the time being when it um, becomes my turn. But thank I thank you for the opportunity. Thank and thanks you. for your welcoming remarks as well. Thank you. Uh, what we usually do on this committee is we uh, usually do 10 minutes if we have like two or three members. Um, and, uh, but what we'll do is we'll do a first five minute round and then, then we'll come back and if someone needs to go over the five minutes, uh, uh, or wants to do a second round. So right now we'll start. And I have a rusty staff that didn't turn on the clock for you, um, Mr. Decker, but uh, don't blame the clock here, staff. <laughs> so here we go. Um, Mr. <laughs> You're giving me four minutes now. That's great. Um, Mr. Decker, I, um, I want to ask you to describe in very short terms why a strategy is important. Sir, very simply, the strategy is a foundation piece in which you can go and implement particular plans and actions and make sure that they achieve some type of uh, end state. Uh, I view strategies, and I think most uh, professionals will look at them as um, roadmaps or concept papers that give you an idea of what has to be accomplished, uh, what is in the nation's best interest, and in a general way, how to go about doing that. So if you have a good strategy, you're off to a good start. 
because from that you can derive many other vehicles and tools that will help you do what you need to do. Thank you. We, um, you have come before this committee before September 11th, uh, as have all three commissions dealing with terrorism. And all three, the Gilmore, the Bremer, the Hart Rudman Commission, uh, made these three points. They said there's a new threat out there. They said you need to develop a new strategy. And then they said um, that you need to reorganize your government accordingly. And I think the only area where they really disagreed was on the reorganization of government. Uh, when we uh, encountered an ally, the, the Soviet Union, a, a, a former ally, the Soviet Union, becoming our enemy, uh, they wanted to destroy us politically, socially, economically, as well as militarily. We uh, brought people in, and um, we, the, the President uh, Truman and then President Eisenhower, and, but with President Eisenhower, he, he brought them into the White House, and it was basically called the Solarium Project. Uh, and they uh, developed the fact that we needed a new strategy, which was basically uh, one of um, containment uh, and reactive and mutually assured destruction. Uh, you accept the fact that that strategy uh, is no longer viable in, uh, in today's, uh, with today's threat? Sir, that's difficult to answer. I, I don't think we've done the... Uh, I'm not asking you what, what, what it should be. It's not difficult to answer. Is that old strategy going to be effective in this uh, war against terrorism? This isn't a trick question. <laughs> no, sir, I understand. Uh, Let me put it this way. Do you agree with all three commissions that said we needed a new strategy? Yes, sir, a piece okay. of the, the national strategy, so, correct. So the answer is that the old strategy doesn't work, correct? It may not be as applicable today. Okay. Um, would you uh, walk me through? You have eight strategies, it seems to me, not Excuse me, you have nine strategies, not eight, unless I'm misreading it. And uh, I would like to know, uh, you have the national security strategy of the United States. Is that, uh, would you be able to articulate that in a fairly coherent way, what that is? Yes, sir. Um, the national security strategy of the United States would be the topmost policy-driven piece that explains uh, what's most important about this nation's security from the international, uh, from a threat standpoint, from an economic, from a uh, issue of democracy. It, it covers all of those aspects of uh, what has to be uh, addressed to ensure our security for our way of life. Now, you blocked it out uh, in the same size as the National Strategy for Homeland Security. Is it equal to or supersede the national strategy for Homeland Security? Sir, that, uh, that issue came, it's confusing to us because of our reading of the document, the, the Homeland Security Strategy, which states that the national security strategy and the national Homeland Security Strategy are mutually supporting documents and represent the topmost tier of, uh, of the strategies. And I guess our sense would be that there is only one national security strategy for the United States, and that encompasses many issues to include the threat that we have from terrorism. And that the Homeland Security Strategy and the national, national strategy for combating terrorism would be the two component pieces that deal with the problem set of terrorism. And so our, our, our concern is, is that it is confusing. If it's confusing to us, and, and we happen to have done quite a bit of work on this, it might be confusing to other agencies, international partners, and so on, as they start to look at specific goals and objectives. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kucinich, what we're going to do is we're going to just do the five-minute rule, the first pass, and 10 the second. And you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Decker, as you uh, stated, there are perhaps 10 national strategies, uh, more or less, 
each with overlapping and interrelated functions, and each with a set of priorities. I'm concerned about the administration's conception of prioritization, however. The strategies describe many broad goals as priorities, but the strategies really don't involve any comparison. This is a priority, that's a priority, everything's a priority. But the process of prioritization means picking what, which comes first. It means choosing where the money will go. Is that, is that not correct? Sir, a strategy should help guide where you put resources against specific issues. Okay, well, let me expand on this, if I may, um, and, and how they relate. Can you tell me from the text of these national strategies which is more important? For example, securing our ports or building missile defenses? Sir, I'd like to answer that by, by saying that perhaps the, the priorities that are articulated in the, the national security strategy would be the big priorities for the nation. But when you get below and into the specific strategies with uh, critical infrastructure protection, uh, cyber uh, um, issues, it gets a little bit more um, difficult to determine at that particular level which priorities are more important right. well, between let, the strategies. Let me help you then. Um, <clears throat> we know the administration is spending $10 billion this year to defend the United States or to try to create a defense against a missile carrying a nuclear warhead while spending less than a tenth of that amount to prevent nuclear material from entering our ports. Is, isn't that right? Sir, I'm not sure of the exact numbers. OK, are. but, but you, you know they're trying to build a national missile defense on one hand, and on the other hand, and there's a lot of money going to that, and on the other hand, there's concern about protecting the ports, and only a fraction of the money that's going to the national missile defense would be going towards the ports. Is that, is that correct? Yes, sir. Now, at the same time, the Central Intelligence Agency reported in its recent national intelligence estimate that the threat of a missile attack is actually less than that of an attack on our ports. Are you familiar with, with that uh, public estimate? The national intelligence estimate? Right. Um, I'm familiar with some. This one, I'm not sure which one you're referring to. Okay, well, it's, it's in the National Intelligence Estimate, the Central Intelligence Agency states that the threat of a missile attack is actually less than that of an attack at our ports. They're saying the ports may require more attention than building a missile defense that may or may not work 10 years from now. Do you have any comment on that in terms of priorities? Or how would you explain these anomalies? Sir, as we've stated in previous testimony, as well as the statement today, our written statement, uh, threat assessments should drive uh, your policies and your strategies. And at the national security uh, strategy level, you look at all threats, and you have to consider what they represent when you're trying to defend against them. My sense is, is that um, there are you know, not just the threat of terrorism, but there are other threats that the, the, you know, the government has to address in different ways to ensure that we are prepared, uh, that we can prevent, if, we, if possible, some of these threats, and if we're not able to prevent them, to deal with the consequences. Well, uh, for example, the administration has not yet been able to make a case that Iraq represents an imminent threat to the United States. Uh, but there's a lot of money going into that and to a preemptive strike against Iraq. And on the other hand, there's not money going for chemical and biological decontamination equipment to our hospitals. I mean, what is, the, in terms of priorities, what's your role? in trying to be able to calibrate the priorities and 
compare one against the other to see if we're actually putting the money where it needs to be put in order to provide a measure of security for people in this country. Sir, when we look at these strategies, um, we really do not critique uh, the priorities per se. We have to assume that the, the government, when they draft the strategy, are using threat assessments and other tools to help them shape that strategy. And if they say that the strategy would, will have four goals or four priorities, and, and here's the, the list of those priorities, we look at those in a, in a general way to ensure that, that they make sense and, and is the rest of the, the implementation driven by those priorities. I, I want to thank the Chair and just point out that uh, in, in connection with this discussion that uh, the administration appears to be ready to spend about $500 billion uh, in, in, in Iraq, but uh, so far there's only about $36 billion that is being uh, offered for securing uh, our own country. It, okay. We'll have disagreements on numbers, but we'll, uh, we'll proceed. Here we go, Mr. Janklow. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Decker, let me ask you if I can. Uh, the national strategy to secure cyberspace, the money laundering strategy, the strategy to combat weapons of mass destruction, uh, the uh, strategy for homeland security, the strategy plan for the war on terrorism, the strategy for combating terrorism, the strategy for cyberspace, the uh, strategy for physical protection of critical infrastructures, and the strategy, national security strategy of the United States, that list that was prepared. Do you know any of those that standing alone aren't important? Are they all important? Do you agree they're all important? Yes, sir. I think they have elements that are, that are in and, the collective and, sense important, yes. And, and am I correct, sir? Your, your, your testimony basically is, is that, uh, or part of your testimony was, we're really not sure at this point in time that we've been able to effectively tie them all together into one comprehensive super strategy, if I can call it that. I, I hate to keep overusing the word strategy or policy or plan or whatever characterization you want to give, but we haven't been able to really effectively tie that into one set of documents yet, have we? Yes, sir. If I could paraphrase, if we looked at the, these 10 strategies, albeit the national drug control strategy is a very small piece. Uh, and this may not be the total list, by the way. This is what we have come across. They represent a collage, if you will, on the government's attempt to deal with the combating terrorism from a very broad look from the national level down to a more focused when you talk about money laundering or weapons of mass destruction. Our sense is, is that because we haven't had time, some of these just came out here literally within the last couple of weeks. Last month, three of them came out. Uh, our sense is, is that they may not be all uh, wired and crosswalked and integrated in a way that if you are that executive in a federal agency or a governor or a company a CEO, that the pieces that really touch you, that you may have a, an important role you may not be able to tease that out. And, sir, two, two, two other things. One, we can't minimize, I think, the whole question of drugs, given the number of revelations that have been made over the last couple of years of the uh, number of terrorist organizations that utilize drugs to, uh, to raise money uh, for, their, for their purposes. And, and so clearly that has a role in this. One and two, what, what is it that prevents? What, what are the institutional forces, what are the, uh, the philosophical forces that prevent our country from just sitting down and coming up with a master strategic plan th that's debated and then becomes the plan, albeit it may be modified at times, but what's preventing us from coming up with a plan? Why do we have to keep issuing new documents every month or two or twice a month or whatever? There isn't anybody that can follow all these. No human being can follow all these. Sir, I would agree with you. Um, the National Security Council, on behalf of the, the President, has the responsibility to, to craft these strategies. But why aren't they? What's prevent, what, what is your sense that's preventing this from happening? Is it, it can't be Republican-Democrat politics. It, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it the bureaucracy, the technocracy, the, um, uh, just our inability to understand it? What, what, what is it that's preventing it from happening? Sir, I think uh, 
First, it's a very complex issue. And when you look at the partners that are involved, that makes it extremely hard to craft. When you talk about the role of the federal government, state, local, the private sector, and the international, and some of that domain you control and some of it you do not control, and it becomes extremely hard when you're, say, with a task force that's charged to, to, to build a document that has um, uh, the ability to, to accomplish, uh, you know, to set clear goals and objectives that are, that are achievable. It wasn't that hard during World War II, after Pearl Harbor. Why is it so difficult now? Sir, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, I think that part of it may be if you look at the, the stand up of the new Department of Homeland Security, the challenges that uh, Governor Ridge is going to have blending 22 agencies, 170,000 people. Um, I heard uh, a comment that one of the major um, you know, issues uh, with some of the agencies was trying to determine perhaps what color uniform uh, would be used by all. God bless America. I thank the gentleman. Uh, at this time, the chair would recognize uh, Congressman Bell from Texas. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I understand that the documents that you provided us today are intended, or I assume they're intended to offer a, a road map, if you will, um, for where we're trying to go in this area of um, the war against terrorism and overall national security. And in looking at the road map, uh, a couple of questions come to mind. Some of them were already touched on uh, by my colleague, Mr. Kucinich, uh, in terms of uh, a port security. Uh, and I think, and I want to be clear, uh, that you agree with the premise that, uh, well, there, the suggestion has been made that a terrorist organization would be much more likely to smuggle a nuclear device into the United States uh, via one of our ports uh, rather than launching some kind of missile attack. Would you agree uh, with that premise? Sir, I think the, the, the threat, the, the intelligence community, law enforcement community would probably agree with that, and I think that is more realistic. And if you take that into consideration, and he didn't touch on specifics, but uh, my understanding is that the budget proposal uh, seeks over $9 billion for missile defenses while seeking less than $1 billion uh, for port security. And coming from Houston, Texas, where we have the, the second largest port in the nation, uh, that's of obvious concern. And I'm curious about the, the reason for that disconnect. Sir, I think the, the, the government uh, tries to to ensure that the, the priorities are set right and that the resources to work on those pro priorities is also um, linked. Um, and this has to be driven by threat assessment. My, my, I, I don't have a reason, an answer to give you why there's a difference between, you know, missile defense and port security. Why would there be a difference, you know, between first responder training issues and, you know, vaccine? It, it's, it's hard to, it's kind of like apples and oranges, if you will, uh, and we're not privileged to, uh, to understand some of the reasoning behind. Well, let me interrupt, because it's not completely apples and oranges, because you all are setting the priorities. And if you've already said that port security is a priority, and I realize there's not going to be a direct matchup in, in terms of dollars, but that's a pretty significant disparity uh, when you're looking at uh, $9 billion compared to less than $1 billion. And, and really looking at the, the same kind of threat. I'm sure it's probably more expensive uh, to develop missile defense systems, um, but that seems like a rather paltry sum uh, to be spending on, on port security. And when you viewed uh, a port like the Port of Houston and actually traveled the waterway and, and viewed it by air and, and see just what a daunting task it is to, to try to protect uh, that amount of shoreline, uh, it's obvious that there's a tremendous amount of expense involved. And if the uh, administration is not willing to make a more serious commitment to it, uh, then it's just going to go unprotected. Do you see any um, ch possibility for change uh, or for this to be uh, addressed further in the future? 
Sir, I think you, you've highlighted one of the key issues that we've stated uh, before, and that is there are going to be an awful lot of vulnerabilities. Governor Ridge and his new responsibilities is going to have to do a balancing act with the resources and be it people or funding to, to address the various concerns that, that he will be handling as the, the head of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, above him, obviously, the President is concerned about many threats, uh, many issues, and, and again, there's not enough funding, resources, energy to cover all the vulnerabilities to this great nation. So it comes down to making uh, leadership decisions. Uh, those have to be driven by information, some of it perhaps that uh, we're not privileged to know and see. Can you touch on the coordination issue for just a moment uh, as to who is going to be overseeing all of this? Because um, that's a rather significant question right now as well. And you're talking about the coordination of the national... Well, of all of these various efforts that we've been Sir. presented with here today. Sir, I suspect, um, you know, some of the newly formed committees on Congress will have direct oversight, particularly when you talk about Homeland Security. Uh, but when you deal with some of the more specific strategies, they touch a lot of different um, activities, particularly here on the Hill. Um, the money laundering, uh, I, I think that the, the banking committees, you know, will be involved with uh, aspects of that. When you talk about the, uh, the National Military Strategic Plan for the War and Terrorism, the House and Senate Armed Services. Now, within the, the administration, uh, this is, again, um, the oversight on whether these organizations are performing, um, it's probably going to be driven to a certain degree by the, the heads of the different agencies tasked to perform the tasks, the, the duties under these different strategies. And the President and his team will have to determine are all the agencies and, eight, and, and departments that are being tasked, are they coming together in a way to make sense? And they will report this out, by the way, sir, through their annual report to Congress on their, you know, the results. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, it's not uh, my intent that all members may, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Murphy. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate your uh, service on this committee. And sorry, and I got so eager, I wanted to leave you out. Mr. Uh, I appreciate you. You, you noticed me. That's you have good. the floor. I'm going to give you an extra minute because of I didn't think that was part of your strategy. But appreciate no, no. You have, you have an extra minute because I simply blew it. Thank you. You know, as I, as I look upon this chart and as I read the many parts here, I'm reminded of in, uh, in the book uh, and also now the, the, the movie Gods and Generals, which featured a lot of Stonewall Jackson, and he described his strategy for dealing with the enemy as mystify, mislead, and surprise. I have to think, and looking at this, any domestic and foreign enemies would look at this and say they don't really quite know how to make sense of this system, although I'm sure it makes sense to someone. And I appreciate it's come out of a comprehensive look of setting many, many goals uh, to combat terrorism. But I, just a couple questions as this goes through, and we can get into more specifics another time on how this is done. But the key feature I see in this is an issue of communication. Can you describe to us how communication is set up between these strategies? For example, same agencies, different agencies, same people, different people. What is the mechanism for that? And I put that in the context of what we found in post 9-11, and as described uh, by other folks up here, the difficulty in communicating between, how many police forces did you say in this nation? 18,000 18, police forces. It's pretty massive. Uh, and, and how these strategies work at that communication to improve upon that? Sir, let me make a comment or two, and I'd like to ask my colleague, uh, Steve, to, uh, to address that. Uh, first off, um, most of these strategies uh, are under the aegis of the, the National Security Council, and many of the, uh, the uh, task forces, the working groups that were put together, and, and most of this is post 9-11. Um, although several of these strategies um, are pre-existing before 9-11 and have been re-adjusted uh, to, to consider the, the impact of terrorism. Different working groups representing different agencies, departments, and uh, sometimes it's the same person that may flow between some working groups. Normally it's not, but there are some key members, participants that are the same. And uh, they're given a charge, if you will, to, uh, to, to work and build a particular document. 
Uh, sometimes an agency um, will be given the lead for the, uh, for the document, uh, pulling in expertise from different uh, agencies and departments as needed. So the partnerships uh, that are developed uh, on these, uh, these working groups uh, vary qu quite a bit depending upon the issue. Now, I'll ask Steve if he can provide a little bit more elaboration on that because uh, some of these obviously are, are very tailored and some of them are very broad. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the, the coordination in general, and this will address one of the earlier questions as well, there's really two major uh, uh, mechanisms for coordinating here. Uh, on the domestic side, you've got the Office of Homeland Security at the level above the individual agencies. You've got the Department of Homeland Security now with a role, but you've got interagency working groups. Uh, and some of these interagency working groups actually work on things like, say, putting these plans together. And then you've got, um, at the individual agency level, you've got lead agencies, which then have um, other cases where agencies would support them. And in a few cases, uh, for example, money laundering, there may be a little bit of confusion about who's the lead agency when you've got, say, Treasury and Justice as both cited as leads in the uh, uh, national money laundering strategy. And, and that's pretty much the domestic side. On the overseas side, you have the National Security Council. And within that, you have interagency groups as well. For example, they had a specific interagency working group to come up with one of their strategies here, the interagency, uh, uh, well, I'll call it the National Strategy for Combating Terrorism. Uh, and then again, you've got the lead agency concept. I guess then you have the other partners, I'll call them. Those are just within the federal family. And the big challenge, as several of you have alluded to on the domestic side, is dealing with the state and local governments and the hundreds of fire departments just within a single state, as well as uh, uh, the 50 states and all their uh, uh, subdivisions in, in state and local level. And then, of course, on the international side, you have the international community where you're dealing with other countries, you're dealing with international organizations and things like that. Now, I guess the key is to keep the international side of our coordination mechanism and our uh, domestic side of the coordination mechanism talking to each other. And I think if you look at the two top-level strategies for both of those, uh, Actually, I think within the two plans, there's a, a good deal of commonality. For example, in the what we'll call the overseas strategy, the uh, national strategy for combating terrorism, there is an explicit objective to implement the other strategy, the, the national strategy for homeland security. So I think those two strategies we look at as the top level strategies, one being offensive and overseas, one being domestic and defensive. Uh, under, the, under the, the top of the pyramid, as Mr. Decker said, which would be the national security strategy. And I'm sorry if our uh, chart is a little bit mystifying and hopefully the enemy finds it that way. But uh, this is how the administration had portrayed those two strategies as being side by side, the national security strategy and then national uh, strategy for homeland security. But as, as Mr. Decker had said, uh, you know, we, we probably see the national strategy for homeland security as being maybe a co-equal uh, with the national strategy for combating terrorism, one being offensive, one defensive, one domestic, one, one overseas. Uh, and then the other strategies, a lot of them are really kind of functional strategies within that. So we do see some kind of hierarchy among these plans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield back my time. I want to just go through, and we're going to have a 10-minute cycle here, um, and I'm not, I'm not saying that members don't have to use the 10 minutes, but I do want to make sure that we cover some things. And if we cover them, then we, you know, and I know my colleague may want to do that as well. Uh, I, I want to ask you four basic questions that I want on the record that are part of your statement. Uh, I want to know what are the essential components of a, su a successful national strategy? That's uh, one of the questions I want. And I want to know, are these found within the eight Bush administration strategies to combat terrorism? So that's my first question. So we would look for uh, several key elements within a national level strategy. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the most important things would be a vision, a mission statement, uh, clear goals and objectives. Uh, roles and responsibilities uh, delineated, uh, a general scheme of how to accomplish some of this, and then some performance measurement um, issues 
uh, so that you can measure your progress. Uh, there also should be, and when you talk about the mission and up in the vision statement, a sense of end state. What um, I'm not clear whether you have attempted to grade all of these eight strategies. I mean, this is a national uh, security strategy, <coughs> a national strategy for combating terrorism, the homeland security, combating weapons of mass destruction, national strategy, national money laundering strategy, securing cyberspace, the physical protection of critical infrastructure. All of these, have you attempted to evaluate and give a a grade of whether it meets the, the test of a good, um, a good strategy. Sir, let me answer the question without grades. Okay. Uh, I would say some of the strategy documents uh, are well written. They have most of the prerequisite pieces that we would expect, and this is for implementation purposes. Uh, the National uh, Strategy for Combating Terrorism it's very well written. It has an excellent threat assessment uh, linkage with why you're doing what you're trying to do. I'm not going to ask you with my time to go through each one. I yes, just sir. want to know. I was going to give you the, 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 goal, the field goals, if you would. Okay. That's fair. Uh, the one that I think um, I would send back to, uh, to, to redo or review would be the um, strategy for the combating weapons of mass destruction. I believe it's only eight pages in length. It really doesn't uh, you know, do the issues that need to be done about the, uh, the, the principles. It, it does talk about some uh, focus areas and no roles and responsibilities. It's, it, it's quite academic. Um, have you seen uh, even those that are basically classified, you've gone through these strategies as well, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what I would like, though, is uh, is I, I do would like you to to look at each one based on how you described what a good strategy is, and I would like you to provide a document to this committee that will distribute to both sides, obviously, uh, outlining uh, on each of those tests how they measure up. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, how will we know if the strategies are effective? <clears throat> So I want to know what performance measures are planned to gauge the effectiveness of the strategies and to what extent is the absence of a terrorist attack validation that our strategies have been successful? So I think the most um, a strategy by itself, as I indicated, is, is, is just a document. It should have um, some pieces that would help guide the implementation. The, the performance measures to gauge the progress of whether you're succeeding against the war on terrorism, by and large, um, that discussion, except in one or two areas, is, I would suspect, still under development. We approach the performance and progress against the war on terrorism a little bit differently. And we, would, we know how hard this is for people to wrestle with. But we, if you consider the war against terrorism or on terrorism, much like the war on poverty, the war on crime, you may never succeed in eliminating it totally. But what you do have in the interim, you have positive um, operational events that uh, lead to larger positive outcomes. For instance, um, when you eliminate the leadership of a group terrorist group, you freeze their financial assets, you reduce the safe havens that they uh, enjoy. Um, you have, in, in essence, accomplished quite a bit that will lead and should lead to a greater outcome, better outcome, which means perhaps less, fewer attacks of significant um, a measure. Thank you. Um, in regards to... Uh, I'm basically asking a question that relates to the first question, but there are aspects of, uh, to combating terrorism that are overlooked or any holes in these strategies. I mean, any, I guess I'm looking for the gaping ones, not the final ones. And you started to do it with one response. But where are the, in, when you look at these eight strategies, where do you see the, the holes? So 
Sir, it links back into the, the review that we, we will do looking at the integration to see where are those true fabrics. When, we, when I asked the team to take a look at that, um, we did not come up with any particular gap except for the one on intelligence. Okay. Um, and how can the NSC, the um, National Security Council, more effectively coordinate the implementation and oversight of the eight national strategies? Is the Office of Homeland Security coordinating and implementing the national strategies? Those are my two questions. Want me to repeat them? Yes, sir, if you could paraphrase it just. Yeah, I want to know how can the NSC more effectively coordinate the implementation and oversight of the eight, of the eight national strategies? So I think first the step would be to better articulate how they all relate to each other and put it in a way that um, Everyone from the uh, Secretary of the Department down to um, uh, you know, GS7 can understand how they all are, are in some type of, uh, of uh, you know, precedence and, and, and therefore. That's Congressman Janklow's a basic concern. Sir, okay. that, would be, that would be number one. Okay. And then once that's done, then you have a better success of, of trying to tease out whether some of the implementation is really being effective and, and efficient in how it's being done. Uh, my sense is, is that, uh, and, and my team, uh, I give them a lot of credit, they uh, looked at all the strategies, they talked to a lot of smart people, and they asked, uh, I think during one meeting at the, at the senior level, um, has the executive branch, have you all come up with a schematic, a graph, uh, graphic uh, depiction of this? And they said, it's too hard. They had not. As far as we know, this is the only depiction of how these kind of hook together, and, and it, obviously it's not perfect, and, and it's very confusing. Okay, now, the one strategy that you added, your ninth strategy, is the national military strategy. Um, so that's, that's what you added there. I, the one area, I think that Mr. Kucinich and I disagree on some statistics and numbers uh, and I happen to believe that preemptive is absolutely essential. Uh, I happen to believe that uh, Iraq represents an imminent threat, not something that's way off in the future. But, but the area where we do agree is that uh, we, before 9-11, talked about what various commissions said, and particularly the Hart Rudman said there needs to be a Department of Homeland Security. In that Department of Homeland Security, when I mentioned it to constituents before 9-11, they said, what are we, Great Britain? Um, it seemed like a foreign thing. Uh, then 9-11 happens. The president believes that he can deal with this issue with a coordinator. A lot of my Democratic colleagues and a few Republicans, and I was one of them, said, you know, we need something more significant. We need, like, a Department of Homeland Security. And he ended up, you know, I think, coming around to where most Democrats were. But the one area that, that uh, Mr. Kucinich and I, I think, had some real problems was that while we knew we needed to reorganize, we never felt that the strategy, was, the threat was properly described. We, we think we, it was more on an intuitive uh, response and that the strategy was never fully described. I want to be fair to Mr. Kucinich, but I think on these two issues, uh, we thought, that should happen. The difference is I felt we needed to get this department moving, and I think this is still a work in progress. Um, so I'm happy we have a department, but I am concerned that the, that the administration didn't really state in succinct way what the threat was and what our strategy was to then begin this uh, Department of Homeland Security. Um, delighted you're here. Um, I'll be recognizing other members, and Mr. Kucinich, I'll start with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. National Security Strategy of the United States of America, Homeland Security, Physical Protection of Critical Infrastructure and Key Assets. Sir, do you see the quandary which arises when preemption could actually be counterproductive 
to assuring the, the security of the United States of America, our home. Sir, I can only answer that uh, the executive branch the president has a lot of challenges he has to address. And these strategies do address significant issues that um, the administration is trying to deal with. I'm going to read from the national security strategy. Uh, the United States has long maintained the option of preemptive actions to counter a sufficient threat to our national security. The greater the threat, the greater is the risk of inaction, and the more compelling the case for taking anticipatory action to defend ourselves, even if uncertainty remains as to the time and place of the enemy's attack. To forestall or prevent such hostile acts by our adversaries, the United States will, if necessary, act preemptively. I, I think to have this hearing without discussing Iraq would be inappropriate because we are talking about a preemptive action against Iraq. And if the administration, and I'm, I'm happy to have any member, I'll, I'll gladly yield to any member who can articulate a case which says that Saddam Hussein has nuclear weapons, has biological and chemical weapons of mass destruction that are usable, has missiles with the potential to strike at this country, has the intention to do so, because I haven't seen anything on the public record which indicates a case for preemptive action, and yet at the same time, the day before our vote on, on the Iraq resolution, the Central Intelligence Agency, in a letter to Senator Graham, uh, indicated that uh, there did not appear to be a, an intention on the part of Iraq to attack the United States. Um, the New York Times last Sunday had a story that indicated that a preemptive attack on the part of the United States against Iraq could result in terrorism being visited upon, on our shores. Would the gentleman like to yield? I'd be happy to jump sure, in. Sure. I mean, I think, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, you know, I, sure. I have a great respect for you, and I think that this would be an excellent opportunity for a colloquy on this, because I'm having trouble understanding what the basis for preemptive action is. Well, I think, uh, frankly, it stems from a lot of the work in this committee. Uh, we, we know that Saddam Hussein had a viable chemical and biological program before the war in the Gulf. We didn't know that he had a viable nuclear program, but he did. Uh, we knew that he had a viable chemical and, and biological program after the war in the Gulf. We didn't know at the time he had a nuclear program until we had a defector who wanted to defect, came before this committee and told us that the, our intelligence community said there is no program and didn't uh, accept his, his name or that he was in charge of it. Uh, we then discovered where the nuclear program was when his two son-in-laws um, came to Jordan. They were debriefed. Uh, I spoke with one of the briefers. Uh, we were immediately able to send um, our colleagues, uh, the inspectors, to those sites. They uncovered the nuclear program. Uh, so we had a clear one then. We destroyed uh, the systems that he had. Uh, and then um, when we started to talk to the men and women who were making those chemical, biological, nuclear programs, uh, Saddam uh, became uh, very belligerent. He started to threaten the inspectors, and we withdrew them. Uh, the fact is uh, that he had one before the war, he had one after the war, and he kicked us out uh, when we started to tear out the roots, not just destroy the, the, uh, the weapon systems. So um, I really think that the, the burden is on Saddam to explain to us what he did with those programs and what he did with the, with the people. He hasn't done that. 
And the section 40, 1441 makes it very clear. He needs to cooperate uh, with the inspectors, uh, and he needs to um, uh, disarm. He's done neither the disarming nor the cooperation. Now, just to give you another example, just finding the empty uh, canisters, the rockets, uh, that were empty. We had testimony in our committee that made it made a point that uh, you don't uh, you don't load your weapon system with the chemical. You you do it just before. Uh, Hans Blix pointed out they were in a new facility. Uh, so I mean I could keep going. I don't know how much longer you want to yield to me, but uh, our testimony before this committee was that. Uh, we know he has a nuclear program. Our allies know he has a nuclear program. Our uh, opponents know he has a nuclear program. Uh, the question is, do we wait until he actually has the weapons-grade material? We had testimony before this committee that pointed out the weapons-grade material is the size of a softball if it's plutonium, the size of, excuse me, a, a baseball if it's plutonium, the size of so a So are you, are you saying based on that that, uh, I, I that have, we should launch an attack against him? No, I'm just saying to you that we believe that he is uh, within months, potentially, of getting nuclear weapons. And I don't even think Jimmy Carter would allow Saddam Hussein to have nuclear weapons. So your de description of imminent, to me, is, um, is answered by that. But I could go on. Well, well, wait, this is, and I appreciate the chair being willing to engage in this colloquy, because we need to explore the ambiguities which exist. Uh, it is ambiguous that Saddam Hussein has nuclear capability right now. I think that actually it's, it's less than ambiguous. He has no nuclear capability at this moment. Uh, according to information that has been made public from our own government, uh, he's at least 10 years away from developing any nuclear capability. However, North Korea, North Korea at this very moment, North Korea is mentioned in a number of these security documents and North Korea has nuclear capability and is actually rattling a nuclear saber. Yet no one is talking about a preemptive attack on North Korea. There's a reason. And, and I, Mr. Chairman, I think you're right. There is a reason. And, and the point is that if we are able to use diplomacy in dealing with North Korea, which has nuclear weapons, which is rattling a nuclear saber, we can do the same thing with Iraq, which doesn't have nuclear weapons, even if they have a program that might not be viable for 10 years. I'm, I want to, to add to this. Could the gentleman just see at one point? Of course, Mr. Chairman. I mean, I think this is important that this our, debate our, take place. Our CIA didn't even know he had a program and denied he had any program. Uh, it was not until uh, we had a defector and his two son-in-laws pointed out that he had a very active program. Uh, it was um, so uh, your comment about the CIA suggesting or someone suggesting it 10 years away, we had testimony before a committee that said it could be six months away. Well, I would, so, I would, I mean, before Mr. this very committee, Mr. Chairman, I would yeah. respectfully suggest that um, the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, however, its defects, is vastly more equipped to make an assessment of the capabilities of another government than would be a defector whose very presence in a committee room suggests that there's some political uh, motive to his participation. Now, I, I, I want to add this, and that is, and just for the record, uh, I think that the chair has made a case that inspections worked to destroy weapons. And that's actually what's going on right now. The inspections worked in the past to destroy Saddam Hussein's weapon-making capability. And the UN inspectors are working to continue to do that right now. And all that, all that I'm saying, Mr. Mr. Chairman, you know, with due respect, because I have the greatest respect for you, is that this doctrine of, of preemption, uh, it doesn't appear that Iraq measures up to what would be the basis for preemptive action, that, that they haven't met that, that level. And on the other hand, uh, North Korea um, presents a greater challenge. And I, I would not advocate an, a preemptive attack against North Korea, but I'd be less inclined to advocate one against uh, Iraq because it hasn't met, met the test 
which would be the threshold of national security document on preemption. And final point here uh, on this, and that is that inasmuch as the Federal Bureau of Investigation has had officials who have indicated a concern that an attack in Iraq would bring about terrorism t to our shores, would, would create lone wolf attacks inside the United States. Then we have to make an assessment whether this doctrine of national security runs actually, uh, uh, calling for preemption, runs actually contrary to this doctrine, which calls for homeland security. And, and Mr. Deckard goes back to the earlier question I asked you, and that is, we are prepared to spend, depending on the estimate, Lawrence Lindsay's estimate, $200 billion, Professor Nordhaus of Yale, anywhere from $99 billion to over a trillion dollars for a war against Iraq, a preemptive strike, occupation, reconstruction, all that money involved, and yet we're not devoting anywhere near the amount of money to secure our borders, our ports, against the kind of attack which the FBI says is now more likely if the United States launches a preemptive attack. So do you have any comment on that? I mean, do you, in your work, do you get a sense of proportion or priorities or anything like that, or are you just are you counting beans? What are you doing? Sir, I have no, I really can't comment on and what you just raised. And I don't count beans. I kind of look at issues and try to, to ensure that they, particularly on these strategies, do they make sense in, in the implementation? Do they have the right component pieces to allow at least the success to be uh, favored? Okay, now, I raise this point, Mr. Chairman. I know my time's expired. I'll make it quick. Um, you would think that these strategies would be integrated. I mean, I would think that's optimum, to have the strategies integrated. Uh, it would seem to me that an integrated strategy said that if you had to use preemption, that would then be in the defense of our, our home. However, if you see the possibility that the use of one strategy might run counter to another strategy. It's an opportunity for discussion. I want to thank the chair for uh, engaging in this discussion. Thank you. At this time, the uh, gentleman would recognize. I thank the gentleman for allowing um, for his yielding to me. Uh, at this time, Mr. Cianclo and uh, Cianclo, I'd love to ask if you would yield a second. Thank you. Uh, just to put on the record, we may be looking at the FBI data slightly differently. Uh, the FBI data that, that I've seen basically has said we will have um, terrorist attacks whether or not there is uh, interaction with Iraq uh, and that uh, potentially, uh, if anything, they may just wait, but the attacks will still come. But we're not going to respond to the blackmail of Iraq. And I would just want to make sure I corrected for the record the, the, the number. I think um, it's very legitimate to raise some real questions about the amount of money that the, the military action will take. Um, but the rebuilding of Iraq, uh, it's very clear the administration said, will be spent with uh, Iraqi oil for the Iraqi people, refeeding them, the people who have been starving, giving them medical help, the people who haven't been getting the medical help. And um, I, I just want to point out that that expense, which will not be small, will be paid for by the 10 percent of the world's oil owned by the Iraqi people. Just, just to make sure that's part of the record. I thank the gentleman for the other Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, Mr. Chairman, other members of the committee, I, um, I, I, I hear people all the time using data and throwing figures around. And, A little louder. Uh, and the, the comment that there's some professor that thinks the war, a, a prospective war, would cost a trillion dollars. Uh, that professor must be in the English department writing fiction. Uh, it couldn't possibly be a person that understands uh, anything about the current world events. Uh, you know, and some people make the suggestion that in the event there were to be a war with Iraq, that America is going to be attacked. 
uh, by terrorists. I, I don't know what America did to uh, become the recipients of the World Trade Center incidents. I clearly don't know what we did to precipitate the individual that was coming down from Canada that was apprehended at the border with the uh, attempt to blow up things in our country. I don't know what we did to uh, encourage the individual uh, to get on the airplane and fly across the ocean with uh, explosives in his shoes so he would try and blow up the, uh, an airliner. I'm, I, I, I don't know what we did to precipitate the coal incident uh, where they blew up one of our ships in Yemen. Um, but maybe someone could explain that to me at some point in time, and I won't be quite so ignorant on the subject as I apparently am uh, right now. But, Mr. Decker, if I can go back to questions with you, uh, I'm really concerned about the fact that all these documents are well-meaning. People that sit and write them uh, put a lot of thought and effort into them, but they do it in some, somewhat of an isolation within the sphere where they're working, and they're not looking at the big picture. You know, and it's going to be terribly difficult in this country to come up with an overall strategy because of the nature of our federal system, uh, because of the nature of the way that, uh, that this country is, stru is structured in the division of responsibilities and, and, and how we operate. In any state, the governor thinks that he or she is the chief ultimate law enforcement official. The mayor of the city knows he or she is. The chief of police really knows it's in their department until you talk to the sheriff who says it's my jurisdiction and the state's attorney says, no, you're all wrong, it's my jurisdiction. Um, the county commission thinks that they have it and we, have any, and we sit around complaining about the way the federal agencies try and interact with each other. And given the fact that these documents are drafted within a political system, where no matter what you do, someone's going to pick on you for not having done the right thing, for not having given the right emphasis to something, for, for, for not having given the right focus, would it be helpful if there was legislation passed that basically mandated an overall document, if I can call it that, an overall strategy that once it's prepared by the executive branch, then will be picked apart, critiqued, and analyzed by the American people, uh, by all of the various special interests, and by the Congress, uh, so that we can respond to it. Because the way we're doing it now, we're never, uh, do you think we're ever going to bring it together into one structure, uh, given the, the way our system operates? Now, I, I realize that's a compound question, but I think you all, by the nodding of your head, you understand what I'm getting at, sir. Sir, let me break your question. You had two parts. Yep. One had to do with um, is legislation needed perhaps to pull this together to make sure it's uh, integrated? And, and I guess the second part is, is, is this mission impossible? Uh, the first part is we've not done enough of the work that we have to, to look at. We know it's confusing, but where are the true gaps in the, the integration of all these strategies? And does it make sense to have one overarching national strategy to combat terrorism with key component pieces? Do you think it does? Well, I think what we did dis determine, I think th there's a merit to having one strategy. However, if, if you look at that one strategy and break it in two parts, like Mr. Caldwell mentioned, you have a homeland security piece, and you have the overseas combating terrorism piece. They represent the domestic and international sections, if you will. Those two component pieces, in my view, could be very nicely crafted into one combating terrorism strategy with obviously the homeland security piece. When you talk about money laundering, weapons of mass destruction, cyber and critical infrastructure protection and those issues, those are more functional, subject driven that would dovetail into not just those two combating terrorism pieces, but perhaps even some larger issues. For instance, the cyber, uh, the protection of critical, critical infrastructure and the cyber piece. You have threats that come from other countries, you know, not just from terrorist groups. So that has to be a broader strategy to deal with things that come out of the national security strategy. I mean, all these do not, when I talk about a pyramid, this is not a pyramid with 
nicely shaped, equal size boxes and blocks that uh, that would look uh, really pretty. This might be, you know, a hybrid, if you will, of uh, you know Egyptian pyramid, a Mayan pyramid, and some others that. But sir, if we do that, if I can interrupt you for a second, if if, if we have all these different structures. How is anybody ever going to comprehend it? Who could pass the test on what it all says and what it all means? Who, 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 who's got to figure it out? Well, that's why there's a crosswalk that's not happened, at least in our view. In that crosswalk, one of the indications we can tell if there's been meaning, has this document, this strategy been linked into this other strategy, is some of those key goals, objectives, and references to this is a support piece for this other strategy, and we've only seen that in in, in one or you know a couple of the of the uh, strategy documents. Uh, there was one revealing uh, um, anecdotal that my team mentioned during an interview with a department. Uh, they were talking to a detailee from another major department that plays in combating terrorism, and uh, the the mention was, did you know about this strategy, which came from the individual, the detailee's um, parent um, department? And he had no idea that, that that strategy was even being drafted. But isn't that always going to be the case, the way we're doing it? Yes, sir. So, so we need another method. This one's proven to, to create a lot of nice documents, but they're not, they may be interrelated, but they're not coordinated. And, and, and if people are never going to figure it out, well, I'd say they're not integrated, that's for sure. And, and, and if you have problems with integration with the documents, you're going to definitely have problems with coordination. And we talk about integrated working groups, integrating working groups. Just the mere fact that we got to bring all these working groups together. You know, somebody once said that for God so loved the world, he didn't send a committee. And, and, and this is what we're dealing with, with all these interagency working groups all the time. When, when, when one member of the group quits and goes and gets another job, you've got to start all over again. Uh, in bringing people up to speed. Isn't there a better way to do it? When, 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 when there was the old NATO um, and the new NATO, there was a supreme allied commander. There was a person who was in charge. When uh, the military is a great model for, for, for this pyramid of getting things done, albeit they have difficulty dealing sometimes with the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps coordinating. Far less today than they used to because the decision was made to really integrate these things into one operating sphere. Please tell me, if you can, why can't this be done with our national security strategy as it pertains to terrorism? Sir, I think it can be done, and that's the, the, the role of leadership. Get the president, the national security advisor, um, getting the team together and, and, and making sure that this constellation of strategies can without, be understood. Without bringing in ego, is this a job for the executive branch or is it a job for the legislative branch? Well, I think legislation of some <clears throat> sort may be very useful in coming to closure on this issue. Thank but the actual, you know, the, the, the degree, the mandating of, of what that language would be, I think I'd have to think about that. The pressure, I mean, through your oversight, I mean, having someone from the executive branch explain why this cannot or is not being, um, you know, integrated or what would it take to integrate would think would be very useful. Uh, I might say to the gentleman, his time is up, but we certainly will make sure that uh, the administration is, in fact, uh, uh, represented and, and, and testifies before the committee to, to point out how they're going to be integrating these, all of them very important strategies, but how are they integrated? And I thank the gentleman for his questions. At this time, the chair would recognize Mr. Bell for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think I sh share some of my colleagues' frustration in that it does seem to be somewhat of a uh, grab bag approach to fighting the, the war on terrorism. Uh, it, it's everybody's responsibility and then at the, the end of the day if something happens, uh, where are we to look? Uh, who is responsible? And I want to take just one area, one of the strategies, and that is the, the national strategy to secure cyberspace. Um, because in, in looking at the document, uh, that was provided, this public-private partnership uh, is suggested. It will be, again, sort of everybody's responsibility, the, the federal government, the private sector, uh, state governments, 
local officials. Uh, who is going to be responsible uh, for implementing uh, the national strategy to, to secure cyberspace? Sir, let me direct that question to Mr. Caldwell. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Caldwell doesn't look that pleased. <laughs> I was actually lost in cyberspace. <laughs> Just off <laughs> coming to me. Just to further illustrate what I was saying, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, let me answer your, your question. Uh, in terms of the cyberspace one, I mean, we have difficulties in a lot of these areas because we've created a new department. There are uh, incredible challenges ahead for this department, and the infrastructure protection is one of those. Um, responsibilities that has now shifted even within the federal government from the, the President's Critical Infrastructure Protection Board to a cabinet level department and it has a division within there that will look at those kinds of issues. And um, the problem that you're talking about in terms of the private partnerships, the partnerships with the private, with uh, state and local governments as well, I mean these are just things we're going to have to get used to in terms of the federal system we live in and the uh, sovereignty and autonomy of, of our state governments and the autonomy we give to the private sector. And, and rightly so. I don't think we want to necessarily change uh, some of our basic precepts here in terms of, of what should be private and public and government and what shouldn't uh, because of these other things. Um, I think that there are incentives and government will, will use the normal incentives it always uses to try to get the, the private sector to do things through either uh, taxation, revenue, uh, subsidization, other types of, of partnership that uh, to try to get the, the government to or the private sector. And, and, and that's fine. Yeah. And, and that's fine. Let me interrupt because yeah. that, that's all well and good. Um, but at the end of the day, somebody has to be re responsible yeah. and, it, and it needs to make sense and it needs to be logical. And yeah. the area of cyberspace uh, if you're to believe the, the story in the Washington Post, and it appeared to be quite credible, that appeared several weeks ago, the Department of Defense is in the uh, process of engaging in massive plans and, and having uh, regular discussions about the ethics involved in, in cyber warfare and mounting a, a, a giant cyber uh, war effort, uh, if you will. Uh, it seems that it would make sense uh, that the Department of Defense would uh, actually or, or would also uh, head up the effort to decide how to, to best guard uh, against cyber warfare uh, in this country. Uh, those who are developing the offense, it seems logical, would be in a very good, pretty good position to uh, also uh, design a, a defense. Does that not make sense to you? Yes, sir, it does. And, and in fact, I believe in the, that the cyber uh, defense area, there are quite a few participants that are um, in the federal level, uh, some in the, uh, the obviously the uh, state, local, private. Some of the different institutions uh, are involved. Uh, there are, are national security issues. There are criminal issues. There are terrorism issues. Um, there are uh, private uh, citizen issues. I mean, there are a lot of participants in that. One, one comment I would make uh, with uh, what Mr. Caldwell said about the, uh, uh, the strategy. When we uh, looked at the strategy, there are some things that are directed, and then there are some things that are, that are hoped, that are, that are um, less, uh, more of a voluntary nature. And my sense is, is that uh, when you're dealing with uh, federal, state, local, private sector, international partners, uh, it's a very delicate uh, walk between what you can direct and what you uh, hope will be the outcome if there's a voluntary participation. And I think that's one of the challenges with the critical infrastructure piece and the, the cyber piece, is people have to be willing to agree with your strategy and make the investment in those areas that they have to to, to allow for this um, comprehensive um, security framework. That's going to be the, the real big challenge. I heard this when I was out in California last year in Southern California and talking to uh, an audience of um, uh, people around that were involved with the Port Authority at um, Los Angeles and Long Beach. 
and the, the issue was, um, you know, how much uh, funding was the federal government going to give to help on port security? And one of the issues that came out of discussion from, and there were partners in there from the union, from private owners, from the state, local, the federal government, uh, that came out of the private sector was, um, you know, when we need to fix the security here, we're also going to need to fix um, a lot of the uh, infrastructure issues because these ports were built back uh, World War II era time period and, and the ships can't get close enough. I mean, there were a lot of issues. And so it's very complicated when you're asking people to put investment in for, in this case, security, be it cyber or physical infrastructure, and there's other ramifications on that investment, and it's very difficult uh, for a lot of activities outside the federal government to know exactly what to do. Sure. Um, while there's still time, I want to touch on one other area that I uh, consider quite important. Obviously, as the chair pointed out, I'm a freshman member, so I've just been here a couple of months. Most of the focus has been on Iraq. A tremendous amount of the focus has been on international terrorism. And I've always felt that we have a very um, reactive government. And we tend to adopt this mindset that yesterday's problem mattered yesterday. Now we need to move on to today's problem and, and tomorrow's problem, uh, forgetting that yesterday's problem can uh, very easily creep back and, and become today's problem. And not too many years ago, uh, back in 1995, 1996, uh, the major threat to many people, or many people considered one of the major threats on the terrorism front, uh, to be domestic terrorism, fringe groups within our uh, own borders. Uh, now, I, as I said, I've been here two months and I've heard no talk about domestic terrorism whatsoever or any efforts. Uh, to infiltrate and, and to make sure uh, that those types of extremist groups are not going to be creeping back into the forefront and doing the uh, kind of damage that we saw in, in Oklahoma City uh, several years back. Uh, I'm curious, have we moved on? Are we just focusing on international terrorism and, and threats from abroad? I understand, obviously, there will be some overlap in these efforts that would not only uh, be uh, effective against international terrorists, but it would also be effective uh, against those types of efforts within our own borders. But it does seem that an overwhelming amount of the concentration is on terrorists abroad, and, and I'm curious as to what that's doing to our focus here at home, if you could comment on that. Sir, uh, recently the, the Department of Justice, the FBI, has released a national threat assessment, which <coughs> we have asked for, and the committee is, has uh, um, you know, requested uh, that this be done as well, going back to 1999. And we've not had a chance to, to review it in its totality, but if it's a good threat assessment, it should have the domestic with either the homegrown variety or foreign variety <coughs> threat, be it from terrorism, in that document. Uh, my understanding is that uh, it is a classified document and there's two versions, but there's a law enforcement sensitive. Uh, we plan to, to review that document to better understand, is it a comprehensive um, assessment? Just to humor us, if you all could start including some of those domestic efforts in these overall plans, that would be great. Sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Bell. Uh, I would like to note, I think Mr. Turner is going to allow us to, uh, excuse me, we, we are joined by uh, Mr. Turner, who is the vice chairman of the committee. And um, it's kind of interesting for me to think that one of our members is a former governor and had that kind of chief executive approach to his questions. And uh, Mr. Turner is the chief executor in Dayton and helped balance budgets. And uh, we're just delighted that you're the vice chairman of the committee and just would recognize you. And I, I think your uh, wish is that we get on to the next panel. Is that correct? I would uh, just note, uh, for the record, last week we had, uh, this committee did have a, um, a briefing by the FBI on the national strategy of threat assessment, um, excuse me, the threat assessment of the, of the FBI. And uh, one of the challenges we have is that, uh, and I said this to you, Mr. Bell, is that, that it is uh, basically a classified document. It's not something the press can talk about. But while some people are focused on Iraq and some uh, in Korea, we, we've got some who couldn't tell you anything about Iraq or Korea, but can tell you a lot about the threat assessment that uh, we're dealing with domestically. A lot's happening. It's pretty impressive. 
Um, at this time, I, I thank you, Mr. Decker, for your and Mr. Caldwell. I think the highlight for me was uh, the question to you on cyberspace stuff. Uh, and uh, I thank uh, all of, both of you for your very fine answers and for the committee's participation. And we been keeping the other panel waiting a bit longer than I thought, but uh, it's been very interesting having you both testify. Uh, at this time, that you, so you, we, we'll go to the next panel. Is there anything I, I guess I should have said, Mr. Decker, that you want to put on the record before we go? Yes, sir, if I can make one comment. Sure. I would hope in a year from now, when this issue is revisited, that it will have been totally sorted out so that we are on an effective path for implementation. Guess what? We're going to have you here in six months, and we're going to hope in six months it's done. Okay? Is that a deal? Yes, sir. And you guys will be pushing the administration. We will. And uh, we're kind of the catalyst, and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll do their job, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, the, the, the chair will announce the second panel. Our second panel is the Honorable James Gilmore III, uh, former governor of <coughs> Virginia Chairman Advisory Panel to assess the domestic response capabilities for terrorism involving weapons of mass destruction. That's why we call it the Gilmore Commission. I think if you want to have a commission named after yourself, you just give it a long title and then they just decide to use the chairman's name. Uh, we have Dr. Michael O'Hanlon, Senior Fellow Foreign Policy Studies, the Sidney Stein Jr. Chair of the Brookings Institution. And uh, we have Dr. Andrew Kopinovich, Executive Director, Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessment, and Mr. John Newhouse, Senior Fellow, Center for Defense Information. I welcome all four to uh, the panel. I'm going to have you stand up uh, and stay standing because I'm going to swear you guys in, gentlemen, in, excuse me. Um, you can raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. We'll note for the record, uh, response to the affirmative. Mr. Newhouse, I'm going to have you move your chair over a little slightly. Dr. Hanlon, you can move yours over slightly, too, and then we get, yeah. Okay, we're, we're changing the batting order a bit. We're going to have uh, Mr. Uh, Governor Gil Gilmore speak first, and then um, um, Dr. Hanlon, you'll be second. And uh, Mr. Newhouse, we're going to have you third, and we're going to have you uh, uh, Mr. Kubinovich, uh, be the cleanup batter here. Um, let me say uh, to you first, um, Mr. Gilmore, uh, Governor Gilmore, you have uh, uh, been before our committee on a number of occasions, and if it hasn't been you, it's been someone else in your commission on the Gilmore Commission. And um, uh, we appreciate what you did before September 11th, and we appreciate what you're doing now. And uh, I have read the testimony uh, that was submitted that was available to me last night, and uh, this is an excellent panel. We're really delighted you all are here. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I'm going to have you turn that mic on, and I'm also going to say that uh, if you would allow me, um, excuse me, let me just do what I should have done before and ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose and without objection so ordered. I ask for the unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record without objection so ordered. Uh, and would say to the witnesses um, that um, if you want to touch on any of the questions uh, that you've heard, uh, we kind of force you to, to listen to the first panel a little bit, but if you can, you know, if there are some points that you think need to be addressed, feel free to do that. And regretfully, um, some of your statements are well even longer than 10 minutes, so I know that you'll have to summarize, so uh, we, we welcome that, but uh, your, your statements were excellent. Sorry for the interruption. We'll start all over again, Governor. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and, and I will uh, summarize, I believe, within the, within the time frame, maybe offer one or two additional thoughts to those that contained within the uh, oral, within the written presentation. Mr. Chairman, uh, pleased to be here with you and with the other, not only with the other members of Congress. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for the chance to be here with you, and particularly my former colleague, Governor Janklow, who's an old pal of mine. So um, nice to see you, Governor, Congressman. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the 9-11, uh, of course, uh, has changed everything. It seems to me like that uh, much of what we are doing and what we're thinking about and the way we're evolving as a nation is certainly being driven by the 9-11 attack. It certainly was traumatic and continues, in my judgment, to be traumatic to this day. And as a result, we're dealing with issues we previously have not dealt with, and we may even deal with them in ways that we, we probably uh, 
would be different than the previous time. Uh, our reports, as you know, we have now four reports. We are the official uh, advisory body to the United States Congress. We were established through the House of Representatives. Congressman Kurt Weldon, I think, initiated it. The Congress passed it. The Senate uh, did as well, and we are your official panel. The uh, commission was established in January of 1999. Uh, at that time, there was no public issue involving this kind of issue uh, at that time. We began to go to work on it in the first year in a somewhat academic way. We established a threat assessment. Uh, we called for a national strategy. We, uh, I believe, appropriately as assessed the threat, and our most recent uh, discussions have confirmed all of that. The second year, we did major policy work, recommending an Office of Homeland Security, recommending the formation of a, of a national strategy, focusing on federal, state, and local involvement, not just federal involvement, focusing on the difficulty of intelligence uh, stovepiping and beginning to establish, I think, the framework for debate. He, that was presented to the Congress and to the President in December of the year 2000. In the year 2001, we focused on some major primary areas and began to get ready to go into business on our three-year commission when the 9-11 attack occurred. So this Congress then, in its wisdom, extended our commission two more years. We have now committed, com completed our fourth commission report. I believe each of you has a copy of this report that has been delivered uh, to your offices. We are now beginning our fifth year uh, of the two-year extension for our fifth uh, year of the, of the commission. Uh, what are my opening remarks? Number one, things have gotten a lot better because we do have these strategies. I think that the, commission, the committee here is doing a real service to the Congress, to the public, by focusing on the plethora of the different groups of strategies and how they interrelate with each other and how that uh, bears upon uh, national security. Uh, but at least we have strategies. We have the, uh, the uh, topics being laid out. That's a judgment call in itself, the, the key and important areas. It looks to me like we're in large measure dealing with the correct types of issues. Our panel in its third year focused our attention on the value and the focus of state and local involvement within the national strategy and how you engage state and local people. A major portion on health care, which has been a primary focus of our commission through all of its uh, four years, the importance of health care and the health care system. The importance of border controls and beginning to watch people going in and out and maybe protect our borders uh, in an appropriate way. The appropriate use of the military, a very profound issue uh, at this time as we begin to uh, tee up the United States military to operate within the homeland, an extremely sensitive and important policy area. And cyber terrorism, these were the areas that we focused on. What are the national strategies focus on at this point? There is an overarching national strategy for the defense of the United States, for the geopolitical position of the United States. There is a strategy for, to counter terrorism, a military plan to operate overseas uh, in order to uh, interdict and uh, disrupt people who would attack us from foreign countries, a homeland security strategy, specific areas of weapons of mass destruction, a strategy for that, uh, money laundering in order to break up the finance for people who would conduct these kinds of military operations, such as those we saw in 9-11, a cyber terrorism strategy, and a critical infrastructure protection strategy. This is uh, similar to the types of issues that we laid out over the last four years, and all of the topics are beginning in a rough way to come together in the appropriate, uh, in the appropriate ways. The trick, it seems to me, is to strive for focus. Uh, in order to make sure that we come together to do the right things. Uh, I think it, one of the earlier speakers said that you need to get to the proper end state, and indeed we do. We need to focus on what we're trying to get to with these proper strategies, not just simply saying that the nation shall be more secure, homeland shall be more secure. What are we looking to achieve here? What is the ultimate goal of all of these uh, strategies? Uh, one key, of course, is to continue to tie in the state and the local authorities. Federal strategy alone will not do that, although most of these strategies, I think, do make reference to the role of states and locals within the respective strategies, and that is certainly a positive uh, point. But the truth of the matter is that you have to have a national strategy, not a federal strategy. And that means that governors 
and key mayors and key law enforcement officials all across the 50 states have to be tied in and included within an overall national strategy. We have to determine from their point of view what they need in their respective states, how it develops into a statewide program, how that interacts with their localities, what kinds of equipment and processes are needed in order to support that kind of strategy. How does the federal government play that kind of role? How do you develop the joint types of fundings? And then how finally do you get into exercising and then measure the results uh, of what uh, that uh, in-state uh, is to be? So therefore, there has to be a complete focus on state and local and with the federal partnership. And that is the in-state that, uh, that our commission has uh, focused on for several years. And then I think we have to ask ourselves in, at the end, what is the goal that we're trying to achieve here? Is absolute security an obtainable goal? Is it attainable? Uh, historically, uh, the answer is probably no. Uh, this is not a unique time that we face here today, although the violence of the 9-11 attack has created a trauma that only replicates itself several times in American history. Uh, but we have seen the previous assassination of President McKinley. So shortly thereafter, only a few years later, a few years later the shooting of Theodore Roosevelt at a political event, shooting and killing of President Lincoln. One might argue that that was in fact a terrorist attack in itself here in the homeland. The Oklahoma City bombing, a domestic catastrophe of tremendous proportions lead up of other areas as well, but this is not necessarily a, a unique time. But we now have to gain the perspective to make sure that as we react to it and we put together our strategies and programs, that we remember the longstanding values that we have as Americans and that we don't uh, impinge upon any of those. And that primarily, of course, leads me back to the theme that we very frequently stress, and that is the civil liberties of the American people. It would be so easy to strive for absolute security and to try to persuade the American people we're going to reach for absolute security and to ask them to surrender all their civil liberties in order to attain that end. Our commission believes that that would be the wrong approach and that the goal here must be to gain the maximum possible security within this country and then to tell the American people in a straightforward and honest way that total and absolute security is not possible. To get to the maximum level of security we can reasonably do consistent with the values and safety of the people of the United States. Naturally, spending a great deal of focus on weapons of mass destruction, because that would be the most terrible possible uh, violation of the security that we might have. But within all those goals, that we believe that the, that the eight strategies are a step in the right direction, and we congratulate this uh, committee for going about the oversight work now of determining how the eight can be harmonized best together and work together for the national security. But I urge you to think closely about the value of making sure the states and the locals are contained within that national strategy. Thank you, Governor. It's a nice way to start this panel. And I, um, I had forgotten that Kurt Weldon had led the charge in this. He's been one of the heroes, I think, on the issue of terrorism well before September 11th. And I'm not sure he gets the credit he deserves. He gets a lot of credit, but I think he deserves more. Um, Thank you. At this time, we would call on uh, Dr. O'Hanlon. Thank you, Congressman and uh, Mr. Ranking Member. It's an honor to be before this committee on this important topic on this distinguished panel. I really want to just make three broad sets of opening comments uh, in keeping with your request that we be brief. And I have a longer statement, as you know, for the record. Uh, one I want to make sure, though, you cover the territory that you need to. OK, well, thank you. Um, I do want to respond in that spirit to your, to many of the questions that were posed to the first panel and just give a couple of quick thoughts on the issue of how many strategies is too many and what kind of overall structure should we have. And I'll, I just have a couple of observations. Uh, it strikes me that you do need more than one strategy because there are so many aspects to the war on terror. Uh, and it's hard to put all this into one document. And uh, I fully agree with Congressman Janklow's comment that if you have too many, you lose track of them all. But if you had too few, it would make, I think, for an excessively dense document that might get weighty of its own simple uh, detail. And so what I would propose is thinking in terms of three principal documents. And one is the national security strategy. And that has to be the lead document, has to be seen as the integrating document. Uh, certainly in traditional terms, that has been the first document that's been produced before the military has done its quadrennial reviews and its national military strategies. 
Uh, and then below that, the national military strategy and the national homeland security strategy are the two natural next pillars. And there are certain things that are going to be left out. Uh, military strategy and homeland security strategy, for example, don't give a lot of time or attention to economic assistance towards developing countries. And we all know we need to worry about the problem of failed states, rescuing failed states, because they are a concern in the war on terror. They can be sanctuaries for terrorist organizations. They can help provide resources to terrorist organizations. But that is part of the national security strategy. And I think President Bush, speaking of people who don't get enough credit, President Bush does not get enough credit for his foreign aid initiative, the Millennium Challenge account, which I think is a very good idea and I think needs more attention and more reinforcement because we need to hold out hope to developing countries that they will be brought into this globalization process and that also we will prevent their territories from being used as sanctuary or sources of income for terrorists. So I commend the President on that point. I think there's more that has to be done dealing with failed states, and I've got some of that in my testimony. Uh, but the national security strategy pr brings in economic assistance, brings in intelligence operations, brings in broader economic strategy as well. Those things are not part of the military strategy or the homeland security strategy quite as much, but that's okay. You don't have to emphasize each and everything uh, equally. At some point, there is a trade-off between having 12 or 15 or 20 strategies and having clarity. And I think the national security strategy can provide enough detail on issues like economic policy towards developing countries uh, and intelligence that we don't need major additional documents. So again, that pyramid of three separate documents, national security strategy, military strategy, homeland security strategy, for me is enough. I feel like I'm in church. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll stick with the Trinity theme and go on now to my two other topics. Uh, one is on the issue of, of homeland security and the homeland security strategy. And now I'm getting more specific. Uh, within this strategy, I just want to make a couple of observations about how well this one particular strategy is working. It is so new, it is so important, uh, and I think we have to spend a lot of time looking at it in detail. And I'll just offer a couple of thoughts based largely on the Brookings work that we've done in the last year and influenced by the work of the Gilmore Commission and others uh, who preceded us with various studies. And first of all, I want to commend the President and the Congress again for a very good start after 9-11. It seems to me there were a lot of very important things done immediately after the tragic terrorist attacks to make sure those sorts of attacks would be difficult to be carried out in the future against us. A lot of work on airport security, uh, a lot of work on bringing together intelligence briefings for the President, uh, a number of preparations on the biological weapons front, largely motivated by the anthrax attacks. And I think a lot of that work was very good. But I think Congress and the President got bogged down a little in 2002. I think the debate over the Department of Homeland Security became seen as the big issue. And it was a big issue, but it can't be the only issue. We have to worry about our actual vulnerabilities. And we can't wait for Secretary Ridge to one or two or three years from now, when he finally has his shop in order, get around to then addressing vulnerabilities. We have to have a debate today on the Homeland Security strategy and its specifics, what it does well, what it does not do well. I think what it does well is to try to prevent the last kind of attack try to prevent the last war, to use the old adage about military operations. You know, people tend to fight the last or refight the last war. And I think we're getting pretty good at stopping airplane attacks, at stopping biological attacks. We haven't gotten as good at a number of other things. And let me just tick off a couple, and you're very well aware of them in this committee, but it's worth emphasizing. Uh, for example, private sector infrastructure. There is this report that just came out that tries to be remedial and talk about some of the things we need to do. But it's not nearly enough. If you look around this country, there are thousands of chemical production facilities which are vulnerable to attack. And if they were attacked, they could produce clouds of toxic fumes that could produce threats to population centers, similar to the Bhopal tragedy in India in the early 1980s. You could have thousands of people die from chemical fumes if these facilities were not well protected. After 9-11, we did a very good job of trying to improve security at nuclear power plants. Perhaps not enough, but we've put quite a bit of effort into that because there are only 103 of them, and we could focus on that problem. But meanwhile, you need to have a longer-term strategy for protecting chemical uh, infrastructure. We have not really done that. So the administration is trusting the private sector to protect its own assets. But an individual private sector owner or businessman 
that person's incentives are different from society's because the individual owner is trying to make a profit, trying to deal with a competitor, and not very worried about a terrorist attack against his facility. The chances of that are astronomically low. So that person's incentives are to compete with his competitors. But as a society, our incentives are to make sure we're not vulnerable to catastrophic attack against our chemical facilities, against the trucking that ships a lot of these facilities, against a lot of the ships going into Houston and other ports that are carrying these sorts of, uh, of chemicals. Chemicals I just take as one example, but it's a very prominent example and one that does not get the attention of nuclear uh, issues, but probably should. Um, another area within Homeland Security where we're not doing enough uh, is the area of bolstering customs. Now, I think there was a great deal of good thinking done on customs and the container security initiative last year by Mr. Bonner and others. A very good idea. Put American inspectors overseas and watch cargo being loaded before it heads towards American shores. The problem is we're not giving Mr. Bonner any resources to do this job more effectively. Uh, in the 2003 budget, there was no additional money, as I understand it, for this effort. And in the 2004 budget, Customs is supposed to get 60, 62 more million dollars. Not nearly enough for the kind of broader, more rigorous inspection regime we need. Uh, we inspect 2 to 3 percent of all cargo entering this country. It's not nearly a high enough percentage. You don't need to reach 100 percent, but you have to do much better than we're doing today. Another area within Homeland Security that is not getting enough attention is the surface-to-air missile threat against airplanes. And there's been a lot of discussion about this in the last few months since the attempted attack against the Israeli airliner. I think we need to consider government action to help airlines either protect themselves with countermeasures or, at a minimum, help them and help airports patrol the grounds around the airport. Now, this is a threat that's become very plain, and if those missiles had, had hit the airplane and brought it down, I am sure we would be responding much more quickly to what uh, is a real threat around the world. And so we should not be taking great comfort in the fact those two missiles happened to miss by a small distance. They made the airplane feel a bump. Uh, how much more of a bump do we need? That's a pretty good uh, impetus to policy uh, right there, and yet we seem to be waiting for the airplane to actually be brought down before we make this a national priority. One last area within Homeland Security, and then I'll wrap up on my final topic. Information technology is a very important area to pursue and promote. As you know, Mr. Chairman, there is some more money in the 2004 Homeland Security budget for in information technology, uh, but it really is not nearly enough because today we are not able to integrate in a real-time basis state, federal, local, international players into databases that would look to try to connect dots. We can share information on suspicious individuals pretty fast. And that's a big improvement since 9-11. We can tell an, an airliner or somebody else, watch out for this individual, A, B, or C. That individual is on a terrorist watch list. That's a good improvement. However, we are not able to process information uh, the kind that we saw before the attacks in 2001, Phoenix memos, uh, dots that need to be connected to discern patterns of terrorist behavior that may be uh, emerging. We don't have the ability yet, in other words, to tie together these information systems in a large database that's uh, capable of processing and looking for patterns of behavior. So we can share names, but that's not good enough. That's a very primitive level of information and infrastructure uh, uh, sharing of data. We've got to do better. Finally, on, on Another matter, and I'll just stop here after pr uh, briefly mentioning the issue of preemption. Um, and I know that time is out, so let me just quickly say uh, the preemption strategy is the national security strategy sort of benchmark or, or famous slogan that went along with the national security strategy last fall. Um, to me, it shows that if you try too hard to make a splash with your national security strategy, you may get yourself into more trouble than you want. Sometimes it's better if these documents are a little more boring and understated, uh, because I personally think the preemption concept is a major mistake as an articulated matter of national security policy. I think it's fine to... to, to <clears throat> why, don't, why don't we debate that issue with okay. you, okay? Okay. Uh, and, and but, but, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly mention uh, one last sentence, please. For me, the problem is on North Korea. North Korea seems to have been influenced by this strategy. At least it's one possible explanation for the current crisis. And I worry that stating the doctrine so plainly 
has actually contributed to the crisis with North Korea. I like the logic behind the preemption concept, but I'm not sure the United States government ought to be stating it so, blo so, so boldly and so plainly. Well, I was trying to figure out why I liked you and then reviewed your uh, bio, and you were a former Peace Corps volunteer. And so that speaks well of you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Newhouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity. Is it turning on? You should get a light that turns on that. Green light, yes. Green light will do it. If it's orange, watch out. I appreciate the opportunity. No, it's not on. Keep talking push and push button. it down. Let's see what you got there. Push this button down here. Ten, nine, eight, seven. No, no. Okay. Down to below, Mr. Newhouse, down here, where it says. Ten, nine. No, we're, I'm sorry. There it, there it goes. There we go. Okay. Great. You just didn't know what part to push there. <laughs> I was about to say that I appreciate the opportunity to offer a few thoughts uh, with regard to this tough and complex subject you're, well, you're dealing with. We appreciate you being here, sir. And um, I'd like to make a few comments on our government's approach to various sources of instability, as I see them, um, since the attack of September 11. Um, Huge opportunities were left in the wake of September 11. Stated simply, most of, the world, most of the world was ready and willing to accept American leadership. We are all Americans, proclaimed the page one, page one headline in Le Monde on September 12, a declaration of solidarity from a most improbable source. In seizing the moment, the administration could and should have set about stabilizing the most serious sources of instability, the Middle East, Southwest Asia, and Northeast Asia. In the Middle East, they could have deployed their new leverage to push Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization into serious negotiations. Quite clearly, Israel's Likud government expected exactly that to happen, especially when on October 2nd, Mr. Bush endorsed the idea of a Palestinian state. Two days later, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon warned Washington not to try to appease the Arabs at our expense. Israel will not be Czechoslovakia, he said. The administration listened. Regime change on the West Bank became more attractive than taking on Israel's Likud government and its allies in Washington. Since World War II, the Arab world has been largely shaped by transient passions, notably anti-colonialism, nationalism, socialism, and Islamism. The single constant, apart from corrupt and or incompetent regimes, has been the Arab-Israeli conflict and a perception throughout the region and most of the world that Washington shares responsibility with Israel for the plight of the Palestinian people. In his speech last week, Mr. Bush offered some hope, saying that, quote, if the terror threat is removed and security improves, unquote, Israel, quote, will be expected to support the creation of a viable Palestinian state. As progress toward peace develops settlement activity in the occupied Excuse territories me, Mr. Newhouse, must end. I'm going to have you move the mic down a speck. Just bring it down a little bit. Yeah. Don't. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's, it's on. It just, yeah, okay. However, Mr. Bush provided no specifics. Who will judge whether the terror threat has been removed or sufficient progress toward peace has been made? A skeptic would say that if the recent past is any guide, Israel's Prime Minister, Mr. Sharon, will make those calls. On April 4 last year, Mr. Bush said, quote, enough is enough, unquote, and he added, quote, I ask Israel to halt its incursions into Palestinian-controlled areas and begin the withdrawal from those cities as has recently occupied. Israeli settlement activity in occupied territories must stop and the occupation must end through withdrawal to secure and recognizable boundaries. Mr. Bush also announced that he was sending Secretary Powell to the Middle East to push for a political settlement. Two days later, Mr. Bush called Sharon and said Israel must pull its forces out of the West Bank, quote, without delay, unquote. And the White House appeared to support Secretary Powell's idea of bringing the parties together in a peace conference. Then Mr. Powell left on a six-day trip to the region, and General Anthony Zinni, the President's special envoy for the Middle East, conveyed to Sharon Mr. Bush's call for Israel to withdraw at once from Palestinian cities. On April 9, three days after the call from the President, Mr. Sharon said that Israel would press on with its offensive in the West Bank. On April 17, Powell returned without the ceasefire he'd been seeking and unable to secure withdrawal of Israeli forces from the West Bank. Meanwhile, Ari Fleischer, the White House press spokesman, was stressing that Sharon was, quote, a man of peace. The tilt toward Mr. Sharon reached the peak of sorts on June 24, 2002, when Mr. Bush told the Palestinian people they would have to replace Yasser Arafat as their leader before Washington would support an independent Palestinian state. Without mentioning Arafat by name, the President made his meaning clear. 
quote, peace requires a new and different Palestinian leadership so that a Palestinian state can be born, he said. Until then, Mr. Bush had resisted the Sharon position that no negotiations could take place until Arafat was gone. Polls on the West Bank have shown that Arafat's approval rating has steadily declined in recent years. It spikes, however, when he is attacked by Sharon. They appear to need each other. Again, in last week's speech, speech, Mr. Bush made the case that regime change in Iraq would provide the conditions for weakening terrorism and helping Palestinians achieve democracy. I disagree. The case for and against attacking Iraq now is complex. It should not be tied into the campaign against terrorism. The connection between Iraq and terrorism is, I think, tenuous at best. Most of the people I know who have followed the affairs <clears throat> of the Middle East over the years would argue that the single unchanging precondition for regional peace and stability is measured but steady progress toward a settlement of the Palestinian issue, starting with an end to Israel's occupation of the West Bank. If the U.S. gets too far adrift from reality in the Middle East, the sole beneficiary would be Osama bin Laden and his legatees if he is dead. Their purpose, indeed, their raison d'etre, is to divide the West from Islam, starting with the Arab world. In the Persian Gulf, the Iranian government reacted to 9-11 by authorizing American search and rescue operations on its soil, the transit of human humanitarian assistance, and cooperation in the formation of the new Afghan government. In many Iranian cities, there were meetings to express sympathy for the victims of the attacks on the U.S. Both hardliners and reformers denounced the attacks, and at that pivotal moment, Iran's reformist government would probably have been politically free to extend its reach to America even further. The combination of sensible steps by Washington on the Arab-Israeli front and improved U.S.-Iranian relations would have further isolated Iraq politically within the region and hence appealed to all sides. But the administration's failure to respond and its harsh reaction, notably the President's axis of evil remark, damaged prospects were beginning to repair a bilateral relationship with Iran of surpassing strategic importance. Pakistan, a nominal ally, is the country that most nearly fits the President's profile of evil. Two of its provenance are provinces are controlled by Taliban and al-Qaeda sympathizers, although the issues that divide Iran and Pakistan have never reached the level of crisis, relations have worsened in recent years, Pakistan's heavy involvement with the Taliban is partly responsible. It is a bone in, in, the Taliban is a bone in Iran's throat. Pakistan's Islamic schools, the madrasas, have become training grounds for terrorists and other radical groups in much of the Muslim world. For now, there may be little that the Musharraf government can do about the chaos and anarchy in parts of the country. But it can and should be held to account for its remarkable decision to make possible North Korea's highly enriched uranium program. Pakistan is known to have provided much or most of, of the program, weapons design, gas centrifuges, materials to make centrifuges, data of the sort that would enable the customer to avoid having to test its devices. The two-way two traffic between Pakistan and North Korea involving ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons technology could have a dangerous ripple effect. The campaign against terrorism generated a sense of common purpose, but at another level also became divisive. Most of Mr. Bush's advisors regard the first and best answer to threats to security as lying in preponderant military force. European governments, along with most others, see military force as a complementary tool in the campaign against terrorism, less essential than a soft power mix of intelligence, law enforcement, border, and financial controls. Terrorism is generally seen as part of a larger problem, not a single problem. Thus far, however, the administration's concern with the causes of terrorism has been minimal, in my view. Its focus instead has been on identifying and destroying the terrorist threat, quote, before it reaches our borders, unquote, if necessary, acting alone and using preemptive force. This thinking is contained in the novel doctrine laid down by the administration last September. Other governments assume, doubtless correctly, that in its reliance on massive military power, the new doctrine downgrades alliances. They also worry that the administration may not feel bound by the body of international rules and restraints that developed after World War II. Taken at face value, the new doctrine justifies preventive war waged without allies and without UN sanction. A doctrine of preemption that relied on very high quality intelligence to, uh, to identify an impending attack well in advance and then head it off would not raise eyebrows. But the Bush doctrine is based instead on prevention and preeminence. That is, taking military power to a level never before seen, that one that would so intimidate all parties that no one would even consider an attack of any kind against the United States. <clears throat> Threats to American interests would be not just discouraged, but precluded. Quote, full spectrum dominance, unquote, was a term for it in defense circles. Anticipatory self-defense is a phrase that Secretary Rumsfeld has used. In practice, such a doctrine harbors many risks. 
If I'm banging on too long, please cut me off, Mr. Chairman. Keep going. That it exaggerates the role and utility of broad military power. The government could find itself unable to carry out programs in other realms, unable, for example, to cooperate effectively with other governments to combat terrorism. Special forces and smart weapons can help in that battle, but other tools, starting with good intelligence and good police work, are more important. No matter how good the performance of the intelligence community, surprises are probably unavoidable. Thus, measuring performance by the standard of prediction is unrealistic and can damage the standing, morale, and performance of intelligence agencies. They are engaged not in winning a war against terrorism, but in managing it, restricting the activities and options of hostile forces. The Bush Doctrine, if taken seriously, would mean that prediction would become the measure of performance because a prevention-based strategy would require a sustained and timely collection of the kind of intelligence that is rarely available, least of all in a form that connects all the dots. Effective intelligence collection must be conducted bilaterally, but with a wide array of countries. After 9-11, offers of help, large and small, poured into Washington from around the world. They were rejected, another opportunity lost. Accepting these offers would have harmed nothing, generated enormous goodwill, and most important, helped at another more important level. What the U.S. has needed from other countries then as now is information, a process through which intelligence may be shared with countries best equipped to penetrate terrorist organizations and cells. Many of these countries took part in the sanctions against Iraq, and most of them have experienced serious difficulties of one kind or another with the terrorist groups located in the extensive region they share. Terrorism may be contained if intelligence services and police agencies acquire the habit of cooperating closely with each other and suppressing their competitive instincts and preference for acting alone. The United States would be the chief beneficiary of such activity, first because it appears to be the primary target of al-Qaeda and sibling terrorist groups, second because it lacks adequate human resources for gathering the intelligence it needs, and third because its ability to eavesdrop on global communications is declining. The rapid growth of commercially available technology is reported as allowing for the creation of all but unbreakable computer codes. Fiber optic lines give off no electronic signals that can be monitored. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Krupinovich, you have a lot of pressure on you uh, because you really have three colleagues who preceded you who have outstanding statements. But I'm comfortably able to tell you that I'm sure you'll do well because I took your statement home last night and I thought it was a wonderful summary of the issue. But we do need to get you the mic, don't we? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like my colleagues, I'll summarize my remarks. Uh, like most of your colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, let me applaud uh, you and the committee, the subcommittee, for, for tackling this issue. It, it really is the missing link. Uh, strategy is about connecting ends and means. We know the ends we want to achieve, the defeat of international terrorism. And we know the means that we're going to apply. It's in the terms of the budget and the resources and the capabilities that we're putting to the task. Uh, what we need to worry about, uh, essentially, is that although the means are impressive, we only get to spend them once. If we choose the wrong strategy, or if we choose the right strategy but do not have sufficient resources to implement it, uh, what we end up doing is, is not only wasting resources, but also wasting time, neither of which can be recovered. And with that in mind, I'd like to offer some comments on the administration's set of strategies. I guess my first comment would be, uh, like some of my colleagues, I do not believe that there's anything inherently wrong with having a hierarchy of strategies, uh, as long as they are comprehensive, consistent, and of course, as long as the strategy is effective. Uh, what I think is, is somewhat remarkable is that uh, in our country we actually have public statements of strategy in wartime. Uh, for example, after Pearl Harbor, I don't recall President Roosevelt uh, saying it's Germany first, uh, which was our, our grand strategy, going after Germany before Japan. I don't remember anyone saying that uh, General MacArthur would be pursuing an island-hopping strategy, avoiding Japanese strong points as his approach to solving the problem of defeating Japan in the Pacific. Uh, football coaches don't advance uh, or announce their, their game plans in advance, nor do chess masters before a chess match. Uh, so I do think that, uh, and I would assume, and quite frankly I would hope, that there are some key aspects of our strategy for waging war on terrorism uh, that are not public, uh, that are classified, as well as some capabilities and some forces to support this strategy. 
Uh, on the other hand, we have to find some way of squaring the circle because Congress is responsible uh, for the power of the purse. They are responsible uh, for the war uh, powers of this country. And so Congress must identify a way to assess the administration's complete strategy. And uh, I, I raise this dilemma. Uh, on the other hand, I, I have no, no solution for this dilemma, certainly uh, not given my status. With respect to the strategies themselves, I think there is much to applaud in terms of the, the effort on the part of the Bush administration. Um, I think, first of all, we need to recognize that this is not just a variation of uh, former strategies, that in fact uh, what we are dealing with here is a dramatically different kind of threat uh, or combination of threats if you want to link the, the prospect of rogue states developing weapons of mass destruction and their unpredictability perhaps leading to these weapons falling into the hand of terrorist organizations. Uh, certainly this is about a, a big a shift in the kind of threat environment as we have seen uh, arguably since the early days of the Cold War. Uh, secondly, I think these strategies, this set of strategies, is clearly an effort to provide at least some point of departure strategic guidance, uh, both in general terms and in terms of the key specific areas uh, that may define the competition. And again, cyberspace, uh, the issue of uh, financial laundering, and, and so on. Uh, yet if that is the glass half full, I, I think we also need to examine the glass that's half empty. Uh, if you look at historical experience, uh, we only have a few data points, but uh, we did not really come up with the strategy for dealing with the Soviet Union, a comprehensive strategy arguably until 1950 when you had NSC 68. Uh, we also found that we had to constantly evolve the strategy to reflect changing circumstances. As you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, uh, we had in 1953 the Solarium Group uh, meeting uh, when President Eisenhower took office, again, to revise and revisit the strategy that had been laid down several years earlier. Uh, so again, this is not a, a, a situation where you come up with a strategy overnight. It's not sort of a, a, a fast food approach to strategy. Uh, this is going to require a lot of work, a lot of hard intellectual work to address a lot of the, the questions, quite frankly, raised by you and by my colleagues here today. Uh, I would point out also that both NSC 68 and the Solarium Group were classified undertakings. Uh, the strategies that I reviewed to the extent that I could, given that at least one of them was classified and as uh, our colleagues pointed out, they were not, several of them just released recently, uh, do lead to some unanswered questions. Uh, and this gets back to my point that further work is, is going to be needed. Uh, and I'll just raise a few here for your consideration. Uh, one, as uh, Mr. O'Hanlon said, is this issue of preemptive attack. Uh, if, if we really do uh, decide to pursue this, this policy or this, this strategic pillar against terrorist or rogue states, uh, we're going to have to get a lot better at things like surprise, stealthy deployments, operating along short timelines, operating over long distances. I don't think you can conduct a surprise attack. Uh, with a precursor being months-long negotiations with allies as to whether or not you can use their forward bases. Uh, so initiatives by the Defense Department, such as converting Trident submarines to, to provide for the stealthy insertion of special operations forces, the increase in the size of special operations forces, these things would be consistent with that kind of strategy. Of course, at the same time, uh, we are also modernizing our air forces built around the ability to deploy large numbers of short-range aircraft to forward bases, which may not be available, at the same time developing no new long-range air capability. Uh, so again, I think at some point you have to begin to look at, at the strategy and, and the means and see where the connects and where the disconnects are. Uh, and again, uh, to paraphrase or, or to copy from my colleagues, do the dots all connect correctly? In terms of uh, port security, uh, I think the, the issue was raised by Michael O'Hanlon. Uh, where is the emphasis? It is, is it at the port of origin, uh, where the goods coming to our shores originate? Uh, there's been talk in the Pentagon about a maritime NORAD, about a naval force that will intercept suspicious cargo ships the way our missile defenses are, are meant to intercept incoming warheads. Uh, or is it at the port of entry? Or is it a combination of these things? And if so, which has priorities? 
And over what time will we phase in these various elements of our strategy? And what is the standard of performance? Uh, how many cargoes are we supposed to be able to intercept and, and, uh, and check out? Uh, so, uh, in the area of port security, uh, it seems to me that we, we know there's a, a danger there. We know there's a threat. Uh, we're devoting means to it, but not quite clear what the, what the linkage is in, in connecting the, the means in order to ensure, ensure that we achieve our ends. Um, there's, if you have a strategy that recognizes that deterrence doesn't work against terrorists, and you may not be able to intercept every terrorist attack, that a big part of your strategy has got to be damage limitation or what we call consequence management. How do you limit the damage of a successful attack? Because that can go a long way towards defeating terrorism. Where is the responsibility? With the federal government, with state governments, with local governments? Uh, for example, uh, once an attack occurs in an American city, is it that city's uh, responsibility alone to deal with it? Uh, I would suspect that we would want to mobilize resources and flow them towards that city. Well, who controls those resources? Can the federal government put the arm out and declare other cities' resources now at its disposal to go to this uh, city that's been attacked? Uh, have we built in the, the transportation assets that allow us to rapidly reinforce uh, this, uh, this city that's just been subjected to attack? Uh, is it that way across the board? Or do we recognize that, for example, in the case of first responders, those people who are on the scene first, you're not going to be able to re reinforce them. Either they're going to be able to do the job quickly or it's going to get out of hand. Have we really thought through the process, the linking of ends and means to make sure that we have an effective defense uh, in dealing with uh, consequence management? Uh, there are other matters that deserve consideration. Uh, the role of our allies. Uh, our alliances were formed in a different era uh, when there was much more common agreement about what the principal threat to our security was. Uh, we find ourselves needing allies more in the global war on terrorism, but perhaps in some cases being able to rely on them less. Certainly we want to rely on them for different things. There's a new division of labor. Uh, we don't want tank armies so much as we want good intelligence, for example. Uh, so how do we devise a new division of labor, and what does that say about our strategy? What resources can we free up to accord to other priorities? Um, I'll just speak very quickly on cost-imposing strategies. It's kind of an arcane term, but it's a strategic term. Uh, bottom line, they spend a million dollars, we spend a hundred billion dollars. That's an awfully effective strategy. Part of our strategy, part of our strategic development has got to be how are we going to offset their ability to pursue cost-imposing strategies on the United States. In summary, I would say that the administration's efforts represent an important initial effort to address the most dramatic shift in our threat environment since the early days of the Cold War. Uh, the effort is both impressive and I would argue incomplete. And we are only at the beginning of a major process, primarily intellectual, to come to grips with this threat and make sure that we have a strategy that can effectively apply our limited resources to achieve the, the very worthy ends that we seek. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. I really appreciate um, all four of your testimonies, and uh, I am so eager to jump in, but I have, uh, I'm going to call on Mr. Janklow uh, to, to start. I would just make a, a comment uh, that will tell you where I'm coming from. At this table, we had an individual who uh, was a doctor of a major medical magazine. And he said, he said, I want to put something on the record. And, he, and this is what he basically put on the record. He said, um, my greatest fear is that a small group of dedicated scientists within a country can create an altered biological agent that could wipe out humanity as we know it. That, to me, was uh, a very real statement of why we can't wait for a lazy country to step in and stop a small group of scientists from creating a biological agent that could wipe out humanity as we know it. In other words, it's not just those countries that seek to work with terrorists, but those who tolerate them. And um, there's not a chance in heck that, that I would think that we would wait, which gets to a topic that you had brought up, Dr. Hanlon, and all of you did, and that's the whole issue of preemption. And my view was that what we would have over the course of the next few months and maybe years is with the world communities, how we define when preemption 
has to happen. Um, so um, I took advantage that I don't often do as chairman to just jump in here. But Mr. Janklo, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all four of you gentlemen for your, for your testimonies. Uh, Dr. O'Hanlon, you, you, you were specific with respect uh, to certain areas. Um, when, when we look at the structure of America, I'll call it the infrastructure of this country, given the way history's developed, or the, we've developed, but for the military bases, the banks, the jails and prisons, nothing's been built secure. Everything, 100% of our country is open. Um, closing those doors uh, and getting into a public safety mentality uh, is just an incredible cultural and physical shift for us. Where do you, th what do you think is the threat assessment with respect to our our public utilities, specifically the electrical grids. Um, all we have are fences that say high voltage keep out where we have the transformers. Yet disabling a transformer is probably one of the easiest things in the world to do. Uh, there isn't a backlog of transformers in this country on the shelf. Um, in the event someone were to start to bring the electrical system down, you could make whole areas of this country uninhabitable for months were it to be done in the winter time, it's incalculable how, how we could deal with it and, and maintain our, our standard of living um, or not turn on each other. Do you, have you ever had a chance to assess the, the question with respect to the electrical utilities or the natural gas utilities, where every so many miles they come up out of the ground um, uh, with the pumps and, and the monitoring, and it would be a no-brainer just to throw a log chain around them and drive off. Uh, pulling them apart. Do you have any comments, sir? It's a very tough questions, Congressman. I share your understanding and your concern on electricity in particular because it's so hard to fix. My understanding, and I'm not an expert in this area, but it could take several months to repair some of the kind of damage one might imagine. That's correct. And during that period of time, as you say, uh, the economy and even the basic ability to ensure uh, heat and other needs for people would be really at risk. I think the way you have to prioritize homeland security, because as you pointed out, we don't want to protect every, every restaurant and every movie theater in this country, at least I hope we don't have to get to that point. But you have to prioritize, and I think the way you do is to say major loss of life, major economic damage, or major damage to the institutions of this country, uh, such as government. Those are the sorts of things we have to focus on most intently. And if there is a plausible risk in one of those areas, you should think hard about doing something about it if you can. As Andy Krepinevich says, there may be situations where the cost is just too high. But I think you've identified a couple of areas where the cost is not that high. And it's a matter of scrutinizing our vulnerability. And I think you've identified a couple of important ones that I should have added to my list. Uh, All together, by the way, I think we can make very good progress on about a $50 billion a year federal budget for Homeland Security. So we're moving in the right direction, but we're not there yet. Thank you. Mr. Newhouse, I, you know, I gathered from your testimony you're rather critical of uh, the way things are going under the current administration. And I noticed from your resume that you were a senior policy advisor to Strobe Talbot with respect to Europe. And I was wondering, did he take your advice on, on how to deal with Europe during the time you were an advisor to him? You can say yes. Rare, sometimes, but rarely, because I found myself uh, in, in persistent um, low-intensity conflicts with the, state, with the State Department bureaucracy. And uh, as, as I'm sure you know, when you go up against the organized bureaucracy, um, the cards are weighted against you. But um, it was fun. <laughs> I wasn't there very long. I, I was there for the last three years of, uh, of, of the Clinton era. And, 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 sir, if I could ask you, with respect, a lot of your testimony dealt with uh, our relationship vis-a-vis -vis Israel, our policy, uh, the policy enunciations by the president. Um, do you know of any strategy that any president has ever employed with respect to Israel that worked? Uh, or the Middle East, uh, Israel vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with the Palestinians, given the uniqueness of the, of the threat to Israel, the constant. I mean, I just, I was there last week, uh, two weeks ago, 
uh, on an international relations uh, Middle East subcommittee uh, uh, trip. And I, it was amazing, just amazing, that to go into grocery stores, you go through magnetometers. To go into malls, you have the wand put over. You can't go into public parking. Uh, the cost of the society for public protection, none of it contributing to economic growth, uh, is an unbelievable drag. And that country is so small, you could put six of them inside my state. And, uh, and, and I just, I can't even imagine a United States uh, with that kind of drag. My question is, do you, do you know of any administration that's had an effective policy with respect to uh, the peace aspects of, uh, of that area? Well, I, I'd say there were two. Um, first, um, the second Eisenhower administration, after the Suez crisis began, and I no longer remember um, what became of that effort. Maybe it was the political calendar. I don't remember. But, but I think the most striking example of this was, uh, was, the, was the, uh, pre the presidency of George W. Bush after the Gulf War, starting with the Madrid Conference. And what, what transpired during the Madrid Conference, when he had all the key players around the table, uh, led eventually to the Oslo peace process. And I think the Oslo peace process set in motion other agreements and a kind of sustained, what appeared to be a sustained process, uh, which ended abruptly in 1995 uh, with the assassination of Prime Minister Rabin. Uh, I would submit that the, the uh, time between the collapse of the Soviet Union and September 11 was a kind of parenthesis during which the one event of lasting historic importance would have been the assassination of Rabin because that ushered in instantly a Likud government and uh, things began to go from, from, from bad to worse. And now it's not as if the blame falls largely on Israel. I mean, it also, it also falls with, with, great, with great weight on the uh, Palestinian liberation organ, its leadership. Uh, but I think the Palestinian moderates, by and large, understand what's, what's been happening to them. And, they, and since it has been happening to them in the most injurious and painful way, they would like to change things, including changing the leadership. They can't change their leadership so long as you've got this nexus of political heavyweights, starting with the, the Likud party in government, uh, that lashes out at the, at the PLO leadership and um, quarantines it, makes a hostage of its leader, uh, says it, uh, they, they, you have to change this. Sir, sir, if I can, if I can ask you, um, if, let's just assume that in this country we were dealing with a, um, an element, a group of people, uh, where the leader funds, uh, contributes funds towards those that are blowing up our people and our facilities, where they contribute support, public rhetoric, um, to give aid and comfort to those that are trying to uh, drive us out of the area. Um, and and I'm, I'm not being overly sympathetic to the Israeli position as much as I am to say that put yourself into their mentality and then deal with uh, what Yasser Arafat and his group have done with respect to uh, the safety in the area or, or the neglect. And it's not benign neglect, it's, uh, it's far more than the benign. Um, and one can understand the uh, the activity that individuals take at self-preservation. Um, I, you know, I, I visited the uh, um, the American military when uh, Patriot missile units that were in Israel a week ago, and I, I, I was just, I frankly was dumbfounded at the uh, um, at the attitude that all of those soldiers had, the men and women had, all the way down to the lowest enlisted ranks as to what their mission was and how important they felt they were for the security and stability uh, in that particular area. I'm just wondering if you have any insight, sir, as to how, uh, coming back to Homeland Security, what is it that we can do in this country to make it safer? I mean, obviously, 9-11, uh, we found out how vulnerable we were. And, and to the extent anybody's committed and was willing to commit suicide, you can wreck a, a powerful lot of damage on the United States over and over and over. What is it that we're not doing that we ought to be doing specifically, if you could list the things, Mr. Newhouse? Well, I began my statement by suggesting what I thought we should do first and foremost in, in bringing stability or greater stability to the region, and I mean the entire region, 
and that is to restart the Middle East peace process. No, no, I mean the United States here. Yeah, but, but only we can do that. I mean, nobody else can restart the Middle East peace process. Okay, so the, you're the, suggesting, the, the Europeans sir. can't do it. The, the quartet, that is to say, the combination of the UN, the European Union, Russia, uh, they cannot do that without the other member of the quartet, the United States, taking the lead. It's just okay, so totally what you're, unrealistic. What you're suggesting, sir, is to the extent that we, the Middle Eastern peace process gets sparted or gets on a better track, things will be safer in the United States. Yes, indeed, because I think that not only does does the region. Uh, use the Arab is the the Palestinian Israeli issue as the principal uh, one of the principal tools for generating recruitment uh, in the region but I think that the larger part most of the Islamic world is profoundly sympathetic to the Palestinian cause would that explain the, the explosions in for example Bali in Indonesia I don't know sir um, Partially, because I mean, I think these things are really all connected. What what, it, what is it that, that inspires an organization like Al Qaeda? It's more than one thing. In in I mean, I think the leadership probably wants to to divide Islam from the Western world if it can. Um, but it uses what whatever whatever grievances, tools that it has available to it, and this is certainly a big one. Thank you. Uh, sir, can I just say, make one, with response to one of your other questions, um, when you said, well, well, they, 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 these people are being terrorized and killed, I just make two comments. The number of people being killed over the, over, since the second intifada began, uh, there's been a great disproportion. A, 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 no, a tragic number of Israeli citizens have, have been killed, that's true, but a quite considerably larger number of Palestinians have been killed in the process, and a great number of Israelis, if they were sitting here, Israelis whom I know personally, um, would would strongly agree with what I with, with what I've said here, uh, but they feel frustrated because they, they have very little control. Amos Elan, one of the great Israeli writers, wrote recently, um, Israel's military power increases on a daily basis, and its security diminishes on a daily basis because Israel is a small <coughs> state with a with a with a with a low birth rate that is that, that lives in a huge sea of uh, of Arabs. Thank you, Mr. Newhouse. Governor Gilmore, would you like to comment on some of the questions? Chairman. Sorry. Respectfully, it is a policy decision about whether the foreign policy of this country is going to shift with respect to support of Israel or their policies. That is not really the topic that we're discussing here today. We're discussing here today the question of what actions the Congress can focus on in order to try to make the homeland more secure. I think that was the essence of Congressman Janklow's uh, ideas about this. And I'm concerned, frankly, about some of the things that I'm, I'm hearing here today. Uh, I think there is a risk here that we are being led down the path of trying to address all vulnerabilities of the nation. You cannot address all vulnerabilities of the nation. Again, that was also said from the, from the, uh, the dais a few moments ago. This nation is a free country. It carries within it, therefore, inherent vulnerabilities. But vulnerability is not threat. Threat is different. Threat is the things that the enemy has the capability of attacking, and they don't have the capability of attacking everything. Uh, they don't, the motivation to attack things and what things are vulnerable, and that is the threat, and that we can address. We can address that if we try to address everything that anyone could imagine, any terrorist could imagine, we are driving ourselves into being a financially exhausted March state is exactly what the enemy probably would like to see us get to. Uh, instead, we have to address that. And then I think you go to a little different question, which is, how are we doing it? Uh, we are setting up a major bureaucracy with the Department of, of Homeland Security. But what are we doing it for? And that is the point to keep the, the, your eye on the ball about here. We don't want to get so tangled up in the administrative efforts to get it all to coordinate and work together, we lose track of what we're trying to do which is to address the potential threats of this country in a reasonable and prioritized way and to address what we really think the potential threats are and for what purpose are we doing that? I don't think it's to make ourselves a March state. I think at some point is to return to some sense of normalcy in this country, not a country like was being described someplace where we're, we're constantly watched and constantly going through, through security measures at the grocery store and things like that. 
But to get back to the point where we, we protect ourselves to the greatest extent possible from reasonable foreseeable risks and threats and then get on with our lives as free people. Otherwise, the enemy's won. Thank you, Governor. Uh, and now, go. Mr. Bell, you'll have 10 minutes. Governor, I couldn't agree with you more when you suggest that there is no way possible um, for us to do uh, everything to keep the homeland safe. And I've said for a long time that you could take every security precaution uh, known to man, some even unknown at this particular point in time and still if someone's willing to kill themselves in order to kill other people, uh, that you're not, there are going to be instances where you can't uh, defend against that. I do believe, though, that after September 11th, we live in a new world in some negative ways, but also some rather positive ways. Um, one being uh, that there has been an awakening and there is a sense of alertness in America that has never seen before. And things that not too long ago would have probably been taken for granted, uh, unattended uh, piece of luggage in a crowded facility uh, will now be pointed out to a security guard. I dare say if uh, an individual like Timothy McVeigh went and tried to purchase an inordinate amount of race car fuel, uh, that that would be reported to some authority. If someone signed up for a flight class and expressed no interest in taking off or, or landing uh, the aircraft, that type of suspicious behavior would be reported. Uh, what I'm curious about uh, is that the only way that works and that that sense of alertness leads to greater security if there really is communication between the various uh, law enforcement authorities. And I hope that that is something positive which has come out of September 11th too because we've all heard the stories of turf wars between uh, various law enforcement entities, the breakdown in communication, information not being transmitted uh, to where it should be going. And I'm curious as to what your feelings are on that particular subject, whether we really have seen uh, better communication between the different levels of law enforcement. Uh, Congressman, it, it of course has to be addressed on two levels. One is technological and the other is cultural. The technological part is a part we still have to reach for, the ability to have some interoperability to address the spectrum issues, to get local responders some capacity to have the ability to use their intercommunications even to allow some spectrum to allow people in the private sector to be able to have some communication capacities within themselves. And that remains, I think, ahead of the Congress. But that's the easier part. The more difficult part is the cultural problem. And that is getting intelligence organizations to communicate with each other. This is an issue that we uh, first began to address in the year 2000 with our report to the Congress of December the 15th of 2000, where we pointed out that there was not uh, information passing back and forth laterally among federal intelligence organizations, FBI, NSA, CIA, all the rest of them. And more importantly, there was not information traveling vertically up and down the line between federal, state, and local people. We have pointed out that while within the federal system, clearances are granted routinely to elected officials uh, to, in the Congress, there are no clearances granted routinely to people in the state bureaucracy who actually have the primary responsibility to deal with these issues. I was the governor of one of the two states directly attacked uh, on 9-11. North New York and Virginia were the two states that were directly attacked. And based upon that, I know from personal experience that there was uh, difficulty with that. In this past report, our fourth annual report, we, have rec we recommended that there be a fusion center of intelligence information that would also have a role to play with federal, state, and local people all within the fusion center the communication uh, back and forth between federal organizations as well, and a form of that was adopted by the President, of course, in his State of the Union address, and we're optimistic that that will be structured in a way that it can be made to work. There is, of course, a major issue about how you're going to conduct counterterrorism activity in the United States to gain that information to go into the Fusion Center from within the homeland. That remains controversial, even with on our commission. Uh, but we think that progress is, in fact, being made. I was briefed at the White House recently. Uh, by Admiral Abbott, the, the acting security, Homeland Security Advisor to the President, uh, who has pointed out that there were efforts, there are efforts being made to create those channels up and down the line between federal, state, and local people. 
Last point, Condition Orange uh, has been widely criticized uh, when, it was, when it came to pass. And uh, you know, I might even have a criticism or two of my own uh, of that. But it does have some value, uh, value in communicating with the terrorists, value in communicating with the American people so that there's not a shock if there's another <clears throat> attack, which would cause a stampede, an overreaction, which I think we all are concerned about. But also, that condition also triggers automatic uh, communications between federal, state, and local people, which I thought was maybe the most significant point. Thank you. Dr. O'Hanlon and Chairman Shays pointed out that he liked you when he realized that you had served in the Peace Corps. I liked you when you started making my case for me on port security, and I greatly appreciate that. And when I was home a, a, a couple of weeks ago, I started talking to people about this, basically to raise the flag and to see who might uh, salute it. But uh, I'm, I'm curious where we go from here, because it's a very legitimate point that when you look at the number of pet petrochemical plants that we have located along the uh, Houston Ship Channel and realize the, the vulnerability of those plants. And I, and I hope that the point you're trying to make is right now you can look at that and say, well, that's your problem or that's uh, their problem. Um, but if there is any kind of strike against that type of plant, then, as you point out, uh, it becomes our problem. Uh, so given that, uh, I'm curious as to what you would recommend. And one thing that I've considered, uh, haven't actually proposed it yet because I want to get input from uh, other people such as yourself, uh, but should, there, should we be looking towards some type of subsidy uh, program for those types of facilities to provide uh, a certain amount of federal assistance? Because I do agree with you, there is a line uh, there, is an, there is an economic line that, that they will reach. Uh, I think most of the plants in my district have, have taken extraordinary measures. There's one chemical plant that I visited that I thought I was going to have to have an MRI conducted before I would gain admittance. Uh, they go through extraordinary um, precautions. Um, but there are, there are limits, and before they're going to go to the full extent, uh, I think they are going to be looking to the federal government for some kind of assistance, and I'm curious as to what your feelings on that would be. Thank you, Congressman. I think, and also wrestling with the point that Governor Gilmore made about how we don't want to get so caught up in homeland security that we bankrupt the country, it's a tough balancing act to work out. Uh, in our Brookings study, we came to a couple of conclusions. One of them is that at the federal level, we do need some more capability in institutions like the Coast Guard and in some of the port security funding to develop port security plans that right now I think federal money needs to go up. It doesn't necessarily need to go up astronomically. The Coast Guard budget already is increasing, but I think the Coast Guard's fleet needs to get bigger. That's one piece of it, but it's not really your primary concern. Your primary concern is actual site defense at the place that we're talking about. And there I think, uh, personally, I'm not strongly opposed to the idea of subsidies, but I'm more um, intrigued by, just based on my uh, research and my discussion with economists at Brookings, an idea that they came up with in the course of our study, which is um, require a certain minimal level of regulation, uh, and a minimal level of security legislatively, but leave the primary effort to the private sector, require many of these facilities to have terrorism insurance, then the insurance market will work to give people incentives to adopt best practices because they can offer lower rates to people who are uh, adopting better security practices. So that's a partial answer. It still doesn't get to your real concern. How do we make sure these facilities aren't themselves bankrupted because we're asking them to uh, adopt a more secure workplace. But again, I think if the, if the level of federal regulation or state regulation is relatively modest, and we say you got to do certain basic things, uh, have monitoring of all your major entrances, have a certain number of security guards on duty, have a certain uh, number of tests per year of your response capability, and then leave it to the private sector insurance markets to help give these people incentives to develop best practices, that may work better than either federal subsidies, because there are so many facilities to subsidize, I don't know how you draw the line, or uh, simply trusting the private sector to get it right on its own. One more point, if I could bring in a separate example, and I'm sorry to go on, but skyscrapers. 
I worry about anthrax being introduced into the air intakes of skyscrapers. As far as I know, there is still no federal requirement or state requirement in most places that these air intake systems be elevated above street level or otherwise protected. Now, we don't want to fortify every building in the country, and we certainly don't want to mandate this happen immediately because it would cost too much. But I think for large buildings, there needs to be a certain push by the federal government for these buildings to get more secure in how they handle their air circulation systems. And then again, the insurance markets can give them incentives to do even more. And they can choose for themselves whether they can afford the additional measures like filtering systems in their air circulation devices and, and that sort of thing. I, I'm, I'm not yet prepared to endorse subsidies because of the sheer number of facilities and the sheer cost of doing so. Uh, but I haven't ruled it out either, and maybe there are certain places we have to at least keep it in mind. If the economies of these plants and facilities, or if their budgets are so stressed by additional security they simply can't do it on their own, we may need to give them at least a temporary helping hand. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Governor Gilmore, I appreciated your comment concerning the sharing of information between local, state, and, and federal governments. Uh, I served as mayor for the city of Dayton. And uh, we actually were one of the few cities and communities that had actually held weapons of mass destruction exercises prior to 9-11. Uh, Attorney General John Ashcroft had attended those exercises. And it was um, phenomenally helpful to our community when 9-11 occurred because we knew uh, who was in charge of what, uh, what streets were to be closed. Uh, people didn't run to the phone book to figure out what agencies we needed to coordinate. There had already been an effort uh, to put together coordination. Uh, with Wright Patterson Air Force Base, the FBI, the, the sheriff, and, and the like. Um, also recently, I attended a, a presentation uh, by NCR concerning the application of business data collection software to Homeland Security issues. And one of the things that, uh, that they discussed um, is that the business process of handling data and information technologies is starting with the questions of what information do we need to know and working backwards and designing your systems. So the question I have for you, uh, Governor and uh, Dr. O'Hanlon, um, is in this process of making certain that we are sharing information, um, what we should be doing, what should we be doing, or how is it going in our efforts to define what do we need to be knowing? What information is it that we need to make certain that we avail ourselves of as we look to sharing that? I think it's a new topic. Uh, the issue of, uh, of what type of data, I suppose you're really referring to, if you talk about a national cash register type of uh, presentation, CR type of presentation. Uh, just in, it was interesting in the discussion because they talked about, do you start with looking at what data you have and start sharing that and coordinating it, or do you start with the question of what do we need to know and at what levels do we need to know it? And they, they clearly indicated that even from the business process, and they believe from the government and the homeland security process, um, that there should be a process of defining what are those things that we believe that we need to know as we go through setting up our systems and sharing that information. I well, there's, there's been, certainly been a lot of discussion that's gone on about the, the DARPA program that uh, the, the Pentagon was attempting to conduct, uh, the total information awareness. It was it depicted at its inception as being so broad that it just scared the living daylights out of everybody. And I think this Congress decided to, uh, to put the clamps on that somewhat. So that was, I think, uh, maybe a, a starting effort to determine what you need to know, and it may have been defined so broadly that it, that it, wouldn't, it wasn't going to go anywhere. Uh, so uh, it may be that, we're, that, that if we can go through a definition process, we can preserve civil liberties and the privacy and anonymity of people as Americans at the same time that we are uh, providing for the capability of our counterterrorism people to focus on the right kinds of individuals or people. But that's a definitional process that has to still be gone through. I think it has to be handled with the greatest care. And the reason is that today we live in an America that has two elements. It may, uh, I'm not sure it's unique at this moment, but yeah, it might be. One is the American mania to fix and manage our problems. Uh, if we say that we've got this problem here, then this great managerial class called the United States of America in 2003 is going to try to find some technological or managerial approach to fixing the problem. And that would go to the question of how you define that. And the second is probably unique in the history of, of mankind is this enormous technological society we live in and the capacity to gather data and to hold data and to keep data. 
uh, which does uh, threaten the potential privacy and character and the values of the American people. Uh, you have to strike that balance. Uh, I think it is entirely a policy question. You will be led, Congressman, to the sense that it is a technological question and a managerial question. It is not. It is a policy question of how much you are going to permit to be accumulated in order to preserve the security of the country. That is a judgment call based upon the values you bring with you to the Congress. Congressman, in this uh, dichotomy you put forth, do you take what information you have and process it more, or do you go out and look for more? Um, you have to do both, but I would emphasize the second piece. I want to do the equivalent of Phoenix memos as much as we can. So what I mean by that, uh, I would like to see local, state, and federal law enforcement authorities sharing information. If we happen to see 10 places in the country where there are people casing airfields all on the same day or two, that sort of thing, you, you, want, you want to know that it's not just uh, one isolated place, and it happens in one place in South Dakota, and one place in Virginia, and one place in Maryland. No one ever knows that it's happened in all these places simultaneously. What you want to do is piece that information together or have it in some kind of a database where uh, somebody with, with a creative idea can write a computer program and say, am I seeing any suspicious behavior that's systematic? And so you want to have data entered into your uh, global, or not global, national, uh, national law enforcement information system that allows that kind of correlation analysis to be done. And whether it's medical supplies being stolen, airfields being cased, uh, crop dusters being rented, there are a lot of things that could fall into the category of the uh, flight training that we all know about now very well from 2001 that you would want to know about, especially if they were happening in more than one place at a time, suggesting some kind of a conspiracy. And that's where you need to generate the data, and probably more of the data than we have today, get it into these databases, and then allow some kind of central analysis through uh, Homeland Security's threat uh, analysis system, or CIA, or what have you. That's the sort of thing that I would want to see much more of. And that's going to require uh, cultural improvements and uh, technological improvements, as Governor Gilmore said before. I think the federal government is going to have to ultimately support improvements in information technology at the state and local level much more, and maybe even subsidize some of that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Newhouse, I, your, your comments were, were very interesting. Um, the, um, some of the analysis, you know, I, I was concerned, um, you know, this certainly was so one-sided that it left out elements of, of um, what we all know is occurring. Um, you state in your, your statements that um, uh, one of the issues um, that needs to occur is starting with an end to is Israel's occupation of the West Bank. I, I didn't notice in your comments the, um, the, the call for the, uh, the ending of suicide uh, bombing attacks. Um, you, your, your statements appear to be solely on the, the responsibility of, the, of what we believe are the responsible states and the democracies interacting instead of on um, uh, the uh, uh, the, the parties that are, are doing very egregious acts, and I'd like some of your comments about that. Well, they certainly are egregious and self-injurious. They are also, if you like, a response to what they see as the illegal occupation of, of their territory and the settlement activity, which everyone has said, including President Bush, has got to stop. Uh, they are also acts being committed by, if you will, rejectionist groups who are also terrorist groups. Um, and uh, the leadership, Mr. Arafat's leadership, which is a, which is a really an awful leadership. It's, it, it, it's corrupt. Uh, it doesn't advance the interests of the Palestinian people in any way. But because it is weak, inherently weak, it is unable to do anything about these acts it has actually tried and failed. Uh, these acts you speak of are being committed by, by the, frankly, terrorist groups. And these are not terrorist groups that export what they do. They are, they are devoted entirely to harming Israel. But there's very little from here that we can do about it. Other, in my opinion, except for doing what I suggested that we, that we do, which is restart the Middle East peace process. Well, I would take it that um, you would not indicate that, that you believe that the suicide bombings are, are advancing the cause of a Palestinian state or, or, no, or no, they're, resulting they're, they're, in a greater likelihood of, of, of that occurring. 
I mean, I mean it, it sets back, obviously, the, the peace process. And when their occurrence is neglected in your comments as um, merely a responsibility of, of or um, the setbacks a result of Israel's reaction, uh, I, I think it, it doesn't provide us with uh, the information that, that you need to come to a conclusion as to what really the United States needs to be doing. Well, I would agree with you that the, the acts of terrorism committed against Israel are certainly, from the, from the point of view of Palestinian interests, are deeply counterproductive. Uh, as of now, there seems to be very little that anyone can do about that directly. The Palestinian leadership has been unable to do anything about it. The Israelis themselves are unable to do anything about it because retaliation simply invites more of the same. So it's a kind of demonic process that's going on. And as I, as I said before, I think there's very little, if anything, that the United States can contribute directly to heading it off, stopping it. Um, but I think the, uh, in, a, in a larger sense, by generating some stability out there and getting the sides together in a peace process, I think is really the only, is the only weapon available. In your comments, you also talked about your concern about uh, the preemption doctrine um, having um, an impact in, of exacerbating the um, threats to the United States. And, and you, you end in a paragraph where you have, terrorism may be contained if intelligence services and police agencies acquire the habit of cooperating closely and with each other in suppressing their competitive instincts and preference for acting alone. When the intelligence services and police agencies are cooperating, what action then would you think would result from that? Well, if they are cooperating, then I think we're in, we're in very good shape. The problem is, is, is getting intelligence agencies and police agencies uh, to cooperate systematically, uh, to cooperate systematically. Frequently, they will cooperate. Well, for example, going back to, I think it was 84, the Los Angeles Olympics. Um, this may have been a first. Maybe it wasn't the first, but we do know that at that time, uh, the CIA and the FBI worked together very closely. They were, they were under a lot of pressure from the White House to do exactly that. Not only that, but they were cooperating with their counterpart agencies in other governments. So that, when they so that in the days preceding the Los Angeles Olympics, the FBI was able to assure members of this body at that time nothing would happen. I mean, they, they categorically said nothing will happen at the Los Angeles Olympics. We've got these groups so penetrated, we know what they're thinking about before they think, or what they're going to do before they do. Uh, much the same thing has happened at other major events. Y2K was an example. Uh, well, the Gulf War, uh, when we rolled up something like 30, I think, uh, different plots to commit terrorist acts. The problem is when, when agencies, both within our country and, and, um, in, and in their dealings with other countries, uh, ramp up in the phrase, for to make sure nothing happens at a given time. The tendency then is after nothing has happened and the event is over is to ramp down and go back to the so-called stovepipe method where information is gathered at one level, a low level, hard intelligence if you will, and it, and it, and it drip, drifts upward to the top and then it stops there. It isn't transferred because knowledge is power. And an agency that has information that perhaps another agency doesn't have can use that, that information to advantage sometimes in the budgetary process. Anyway, it's counterintuitive to cooperate. Has been in the past. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Um, <coughs> Chairman Chase. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I am really eager to get into this dialogue. I love this panel. And, uh, I think I'm, I guess I'm fascinated by the issue because we've thought for four years about this. You know, in, in, the, in the beginning, uh, Governor Gilmore, it was almost theoretical because, you know, we just didn't come to grips with it and fully until 9-11. But this is what I want to first start out with. After 9-11, the eight national strategies to combat terrorism, this is what I'm hearing from this panel that after 9-11, the eight national strategies to combat terrorism are a good s start, but there is more work to be done. And then Dr. Um, 
uh, uh, Krupinovich, I'm sorry. Um, I, I look at your statement and you say, you know, the National Security Act of 1947, it took 19 until 1958 before it was structured. The structure was refined, and then you put in parentheses, and even then it was only partial. So, you know, we looked for a number of years before we had a reorganization that, that fit into this and, and, and a sense of the strategy. Now, so, uh, and, and you had Eisenhower in 52. I mean, you, you had all these stages of, of trying to improve this, this response to what was then the, the Soviet Union. Um, so, what I want to know is, you think this is a good starting point, if you all agree, um, and that we need more work needs to be done. This is the areas that I sense you're saying. Integration among the strategies. Intelligence strategy, big question mark, because that was pointed out as not existing. Should there be an intelligence strategy, or is there one that we just don't sense? Ensuring there are national not federal strategies. I think that, you know, Governor Gilmore, that was your point, interesting concept of national versus federal. Um, and the need for more clear measures of effectiveness. So that's where the work needs to be done. And would you agree? And then would you want to speak to it? And would you want to add a, four, a fifth or sixth? And I'll start with you, Doctor. Uh, I think uh, in terms of uh, are we off to a good start, uh, we're, we're better off than we were uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm not quite sure what to compare this to. Uh, are the strategies integrated? Uh, I think uh, as certain members of this panel have indicated, we, we think, uh, or uh, let me speak for myself, I think there are certainly gaps. Uh, that right. I raised a number of issues where we don't really seem to have come to grips with, uh, with some of these issues yet. Uh, do we need an, an intelligence strategy? Uh, I think uh, if, if we're going to do what Governor Gilmore suggests, uh, which I think is, is probably the way to get around the cost-imposing strategy that the terrorists uh, intentionally or unintentionally are pursuing, the way to do it is to get them as opposed to trying to provide an airtight defense of ourselves. Uh, doing that uh, certainly is going to require uh, expert intelligence. Uh, we, we have underinvested in human intelligence of, of the kind that is typically crucial to breaking down these organizations. So, so would your point be that we need an intelligence strategy added to this list of strategies and then integrate it? Uh, well, I, I would say uh, you, uh, certainly you could uh, look at a strategy for how you're going to employ your terrorist assets. Uh, it, it should fall out of your, your overall strategy. For example, if you're going to emphasize preemption, uh, then I think the weight of your intelligence effort is, is going to be overseas. If you're going to emphasize a layered defense of the continental United States and, and Alaska and Hawaii, uh, then may more, more of your intelligence may be at uh, efforts may be at, at our borders and internal to the United States. Uh, which is a different kind of intelligence. So I, I do think that obviously the kind of strategy you choose begins to inform how you're going to apply your, your intelligence assets and, and what kind of priorities you're going to place on them. Um, in terms of, of measures of effectiveness, uh, I, I think we've, we've only begun to scratch the surface uh, on this. Uh, for example, uh, the, I think the, uh, the National Strategy for Combating Terrorism says we'll, we'll know what we've won when Americans uh, feel safe and secure and, and free of a terrorist threat. Uh, that's probably true, but it doesn't really give the person who has to execute a strategy much of a sense of what they need to do to try and, and achieve that end. Uh, I would say two strategic measures of effectiveness uh, that I would certainly consider is one is what is an acceptable level of damage uh, for the United States to incur. If it's impossible to provide airtight security over the United States, what's an acceptable level of damage and can we achieve it? Uh, you know, which strategic alternative can give us the best prospect of, of essentially suffering an attack and, and having an acceptable level of damage. The other is our freedom of action, uh, because it's not only our ability to defend ourselves here at home, it's our ability to protect our vital interests overseas. And if we feel under such risk of attack here uh, that we forego uh, our ability to, for example, protect critical areas, whether it's East Asia, the Persian Gulf, where we have vital interests, then we will have been deterred uh, because of our vulnerability here at home or our ability to, to deal with the, the threat uh, abroad. 
Um, so I, I do think that in terms of measures of effectiveness, uh, again, you, and you can go up and down the line, whether it's uh, dealing with cyber attacks. But bottom um, line is there needs to be a lot more improvement in the whole issue of, of whether we're effective or not and determining how we'll even measure effectiveness. Absolutely. Okay. Let me get to Mr. Newhouse. Do you want to speak to the issue of, of, of yes, uh, improve the integration? Do we need an intelligence strategy, national versus the federal issue? and? measures of effectiveness and any other strategy? I'm asking you, Mr. Newhouse. Oh. If you don't want to speak to it, I'll just go to Dr. O'Hanlon, if you want. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think that um, we spent a lot of time on this today, and I think that Governor Gilmore and Dr. O'Hanlon have a lot more that would be useful to you to say on this okay, issue yeah, than I. Thank you. Let me just get to them, and I'll get to you on another question. But Dr. Dr. O'Hanlon, one thing I'll say about a Peace Corps volunteer is um, we, we were taught to understand the people that we lived with, and there were things that we did and said that um, when you understood their culture, you were able to interact and communicate with them. Um, is there a role that needs to be played here in our strategy on terrorism as well? I'm jumping ahead, and then I'm going to get to Do you know what I just asked you? Yeah, it's a tough question. Um, I mean, clearly the answer is yes, you need to understand your partners and the needs of other countries. I don't know how to build it into a formalized process like this, like today's uh, focus on security strategies. But maybe, maybe what I would say, Congressman, is that the national security strategy, which really should be at the pinnacle and does have some discussion of the needs of developing countries uh, to take one category of overseas partners, it sort of gets cheapened when there are all these other strategies that are out there. And I worry about the proliferation of documents because we should all still be reading and developing and debating the national security strategy. And we did for a while in the fall, and then preemption was the flavor of the month for a few weeks, and now we're on to other documents. And, and, I do th and there, there's a lot of stuff in the national security strategy that has nothing to do with preemption, as you well know. Largely, this economic assistance issue for developing countries who are very important partners of ours in counterterrorism. So it's not a very yeah. clear answer. I, I kind of got you off the topic here, and I'm yeah. sorry. I was eager to share a bias that I have yeah. here without thinking it through. Let me just ask you to address the issue. Uh, the eight strategies, good start, uh, better integration. Uh, do we need an intelligence strategy, uh, national, not federal, and the whole issue of a federal? I'll just, I'll just comment on a couple of them. Uh, sure. I had the opportunity to. Um, at least tangentially talk about a couple of the others already. Uh, at the issue of uh, national versus federal response, it does occur to me that we need to spend more time thinking about the state and local role. Um, obviously, Governor Gilmore has much more experience in this than I do, but I, for example, have some contacts at the LA City Council who are very concerned about the delay in the first responder fund uh, over the last year. And Washington, I think, let down the states and the local governments in having this uh, having the stalemate on that. And one can look for different uh, people to blame, but the bottom line is I think Washington didn't get the job done until too late. And we spent a whole year when we should have been dealing with first responder capacity improving that, and we really didn't do much. In fact, I'm told that in LA City Council debates, advocates of doing more were often stymied because others would say, hey, Washington's going to help us pretty soon. We don't, we don't have to find the money. Just wait, and the $3.5 billion is going to start to come our way. And people who wanted to find local funds, therefore, had their own argument for finding local funds undercut by this promise from Washington that was not fulfilled for a full year. So uh, maybe we, you know, I hate to call for more strategies, but maybe we do need to get the, uh, the, the federal versus national distinction a little more prominent in our thinking and spend more time. I was delighted to see the governors uh, put some pressure on Washington a couple of weeks ago, and I think we need more of that. I'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Um, Governor Gilmer, and I, I guess I'll take my next round to just talk about bi the whole issue of multilateral, bi um, unilateral, and this whole issue of uh, preemptive. Uh, Congressman, it is a good start. We didn't have a national strategy just before 911 of any kind. Uh, now we have uh, eight strategies, and uh, I, I, I guess I'd like to think about them a little bit, and our commission, I think, will think about all of them a little bit. I believe that will be a topic we will address in this fifth year for the Congress and, and for the President and try to think through that. I think we should make sure they don't contradict each other or that they don't uh, place different emphases. But uh, I think 
we're going to find that these are uh, supplement each other and that some of the strategies like the cyber and so on like that are points of emphasis, the military strategy for overseas. And I'm not sure that I see them as something that uh, where you have to try to conglomerate them into one overall strategy. I think it might work out all right, but we'll, we'll take a look at that. The intelligence piece is, is really tricky. This is very, very difficult. We have placed a great emphasis on this all of our five year, four years that we've been in existence and, and recommended that stovepiping be broken through and the fusion center be created and the culture of separation be broken down between all these different uh, agencies. The, the trick is that you do all that and you, you run the risk of contaminating the society by, by looking over the shoulder of regular people out there that are just trying to live their lives every day. So this is tricky. It means that you, we all believe that you have to do effective sharing of information to get at the bad guys. But at the same time, you have to find some method to not be looking over the shoulder of the good guys. This is, this is a very tricky challenge. National, not federal, absolutely. And I think that this is the real, maybe one of the focuses I would say to you, Congressman Chase. The, the danger here is that we're going to get so caught up with how you put the agencies together and the department together and you implement everything that we, that we don't, we lose some focus and momentum towards actually doing the things that are going to be necessary. I am uneasy with the idea that, that every witness that comes before you for the next year is going to enlist that vulnerability that he sees within his own state and then, of course, naturally demand money to go into that state to take care of that vulnerability. That's not a very good approach. Uh, instead, you have to find an all hazards type of approach, one that really focuses on enabling the states to create state-oriented plans in cooperation with their localities so that instead of worrying about any individual chemical plant, you enable your localities and your states to observe that plant, all the plants, all the railroads, all the airlines, and to enable them to be watched in a, in a reasonable way and to respond if an attack does occur and to circumscribe the potential attack. The key issue is implementing that, really not worrying so much about the organization as implementation of the program to in fact get out here and to, and to get proper funding in accordance with a proper strategy, in accordance with a proper state plan, and then make sure that they are properly equipped, enabled, they know who's on first, and that it's properly exercised and ultimately measured. Mr. Chairman, I would love to come back when uh, the governor's had a chance if he has some follow-up question. I'd love to just get in the issue of preemption. Go ahead, then I'll go. Is that right, Mr. Um, Dr. Kapinovich, do you agree with Dr. O'Hanlon that a policy of preemptive self-defense should be more implicit than explicit? Uh. I agree with him to the extent that, uh, in a sense, a, uh, the option of preemption is nothing new. Uh, for example, in the solarium study you, you cited, uh, one of the three groups explicitly looked at conducting what was called a preventive war against the Soviet Union. President Kennedy explored in great detail and actually engaged the Soviets in discussions about a preemptive attack on China's uh, developing nuclear facilities. Uh, certainly, President Clinton uh, debated with his security advisors the, the prospect of preempting, conducting a preemptive attack on uh, the North Korean reactor at Yongbyon. Uh, so this is not new. It's, it's, it's always been an option in our arsenal. I, I think what uh, – so it's not clear that it's anything particularly new. Uh, I, I think perhaps uh, by stating it as, as boldly as the President did, uh, it, it might have garnered some un, uh, unwanted attention uh, on the part of the administration. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's, it's also necessary to point out to people that the, the last big threat that we faced, uh, the Soviet Union, was a threat that we felt could be deterred. And, and so that was where we put uh, a lot of our eggs in, in the basket of deterrence. Uh, and that is why we had public statements of strategy, uh, because again, we wanted to not only we wanted to get into the minds of the Soviets. Uh, we wanted them to understand that uh, any unacceptable action on their part would produce catastrophic consequences for them. Well, what do you do when you can't deter uh, a group that can inflict substantial damage on your country? Uh, you have to begin to reweight uh, your your balance of options, and this administration. 
uh, has argued that uh, preemption, which is really preventive war in the case of Iraq, and I'm not quite sure how you preempt somebody you're already at war with, which is we're already at war with terrorists. Uh, so, but any, at any rate, uh, certainly I, I think you've got to prepare the American people for the fact that we are going to be acting perhaps quite differently than we have in the past. And the reason is that because our, our traditional reliance on deterrence has been eroded. And I, I think uh, while that's always been there, uh, you, you have, again, you've got to prepare the American public and you've got to make the case to its elected representatives uh, for their support to develop the capabilities because they're not uh, identical to the kinds of capabilities you would want for a posture of deterrence. Uh, Governor Gilmore, would you speak to this issue, please? Uh, come here next. Huh? <laughs> I'll just preface it by saying I think this is a huge issue that I think there has to be lots of debate about. And I think, Dr. O'Hanlon, I don't come down on your side of this argument because it strikes me that the world community has to know that they can't allow a small group of dedicated scientists within their border to do something that could wipe out humanity. And that the, our own country, we have to be honest with our own folks and say this isn't an, an uh, this need is, needs to be stated explicitly because this is the world you live in. It's a different world. So I'm, I'm giving you my answer to it, but I'd be happy to have you comment to, to it, Governor. Congressman, I think we have an obligation to be very precise on our threat assessment uh, before we uh, decide to take serious military action. Uh, intelligence community ought to be able to give us some testable advice about uh, any particular risk. The uh, chance of a dedicated group of scientists someplace creating a uh, bioweapon that can destroy humanity is remote. Uh, so you should be cautious about... Why do you say it's remote? It's hard to do. Uh, all the information that our commission has, uh, has gotten is that it is extremely difficult to get these weapons, extremely difficult to weaponize them, and extremely difficult to deliver them. Yeah. We were not prepared to rule out a weapon of mass destruction attack on the United States, but in the very first year we assessed the likelihood of a conventional attack on this country as being highly probable. The chance of a weapon of mass destruction attack on this country as being highly improbable not completely beyond the pale, and that's why we've considered it content on a continuous basis as we've gone on, but our most recent threat assessment contained in our fourth report changes that analysis not one whit. It's just uh, very difficult to deliver those kinds of weapons, and we should be cautious about governing policy uh, along those no, it, lines. It's difficult if you're not willing to, to carry it yourself. But if you're willing to carry it yourself, it becomes a lot easier. Well, if you can get it. If you're and it, it, right, there are two parts. If you can get it, but if you're willing to infect yourself and others who, uh, like, were very willing to, you know, uh, be blown up in an airplane that hit a building, it strikes me that the reality becomes very different. Yeah, it, but it's, uh, diffi it's, it's very difficult to get those weapons. It's very difficult to create those weapons. It's very difficult to get smallpox, uh, for example. Very difficult. Very difficult to weaponize it. Um, there are still... If, if our suggestions are put into place, particularly on the health side, which has been the greatest extent of our work, by the way, for the four years, uh, has been the health piece and the public health system and the ability of hospitals to deal with this, you could contain those kinds of attacks should they occur, but they still remain highly unlikely compared to that which terrorists can get, which is explosive devices, hijackings, uh, attacking vulnerable points, that is very likely and has, uh, of course, uh, been falling out. I think your question, though, is, uh, with respect to this, is I think 911 is driving and coloring the policy decisions that the Congress is making, that the, uh, the executive branch is making. The, the, the threat seems so much more real after 911 uh, in terms of the potential uh, attack, which then leads us to the, to the analysis that if you allow either a terrorist organization or a foreign country to uh, continue to develop these kinds of weapons and with the visceral fear that we now have in America of this kind of attack, then that leads us more towards a policy of preemption. 
the notion being that, uh, that we can't allow someone to develop that kind of weapon and put us in that kind of position, even if they can't get the weapon here, which they probably can't, uh, they could get it around their neighbors and then in that position upset the entire balance of a major region where the national interests of the United States are at stake. This, I believe, is the analysis of the, executive, of the President. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Governor. Governor, do you have any additional questions? Thank you. Let me, let me just, if I can, pick up on where uh, Congressman Shays uh, left off and the comments that, that some of you panelists made. Uh, Governor Gilmore, it's extremely difficult to, to manufacture these. Um, there's no question about that. But when a state sponsors the research and the manufacturing, just exactly like has gone on historically in the Soviet Union, uh, what has gone on in North Korea, and clearly what's gone on in Iraq. I mean, we can all argue and we will continue to argue about what it is and what is or isn't present in Iraq. But after the inspection started, uh, back in the 90s, and after several years, and after Saddam Hussein's son-in-laws came out of the country, um, and, and they and others talked about what was inside the country, all of a sudden the world, he, there was an admission. There was anthrax in the country in substantial quantities, very substantial quantities, and research going on. There was smallpox within the country. There was no candid admission. But I don't think there's been any intelligence service from any country that hasn't uh, uh, um, understood that there's been uh, smallpox research going on in, uh, in Iraq. Clearly, there was research with respect to ricin and, and some of the other types of weapons of mass destruction. You don't have to wipe out the human race in order to wreck it especially when you live in as sophisticated a society and economy as we have. 9-11 is a classic example of the hundreds of billions of dollars worth the price we're paying for those particular incidences taking place. Our country's had a long history of explosions, anti-war efforts blowing up buildings at the University of Wisconsin, as I recall the Symbionese Liberation Army, the SLA. Uh, back a couple decades ago and explosions they were doing, things that uh, uh, some other groups were, were involved in. Europe clearly had the Red Guard and all of the, those types of things. Japan's had the incidents in there uh, with respect to poisonous gas. But the point is, it doesn't take much in a society to, to change the standard of living, to change the culture. You keep talking about, very eloquently, uh, Governor, about um, how we have to just evaluate all this and then we have to uh, um, make policy decisions. But the fact of the matter is, no one that ever drafted our Bill of Rights or subsequently has dealt with it ever had in mind the kinds of terrorism or the kinds of wanton acts that human beings would do to one another with respect to deliberately inflicting diseases and those types of things. Um, so, I mean, we have a tremendous challenge, as you keep saying all the time, where do we draw that line? Um, I think hoof and mouth disease, although it has been with animals, is a classic example of how easy it is to spread. For example, smallpox uh, is not a difficult disease to spread. Um, clearly, it's done by contact. But to the extent people are as mobile as they are in today's world, um, it, again, if someone's willing to die and infect themselves with smallpox and then willing to die, they can have a huge amount of contact with others uh, through airports and other places, uh, public arenas and what have you, before they reach the point where they're no longer capable of being a bomb themselves. So after having said all this rhetoric, my question is to you and to you, Mr. Krepinovich, what is it, where, what is it that should be expected of us? If you're a citizen out there, what is it that they should expect of us to be able to do? Is there anything we can do in the legislative sense, or is our responsibility to talk about it? What is it that should be expected of us? It's a very great policy question. I don't think that the American people should expect of their legislators that they're going to provide them complete security from all imaginable t attacks and terrorism. I don't think the legislature can do that. Uh, it's unrealistic to hold you accountable 
for some diseased mind and some idea that somebody might come forward with. And you know, it doesn't even have to be a weapon of mass destruction. It can be a bomb in a local McDonald's in downtown St. Louis. It could be snipers. It could be snipers. It could be. People and trunks. you know, it, I think that we have to begin to go through the education process that says that we are going to assess the risk in a realistic way. We are going to uh, take the appropriate measures that are realistic based upon those threats, those realistic threats. And then we're going to get on with our lives uh, and understand that we're going to live like we, we have always lived. Uh, and I think that's uh, uh, part of the answer about expectations. Um, I mean, it's clear that, uh, uh, that you don't have to have weapons of mass destruction to, to wreck the society. I think the society is on a hair trigger. Uh, right now, and I think that we need to back away from that a little bit. The uh, agricultural terrorism, by the way, I want to just throw in, uh, since you raised it, Congressman, that we have a whole chapter here on agricultural terrorism. So we are not uh, excluding any possibility of a weapon of mass destruction, hoof and mouth disease, or any other type of potential attack. But we think there's an obligation to reasonably assess the threats in a realistic way, try to avoid, in a perfect world, I suppose, trying to guard against everything for fear that if you miss something and something bad happens, then some commentator or a newspaper is going to criticize you and say that you didn't think of that. That's what they do, though. They do. But you can't think of everything. And, no, no. Uh, and, we have to be, and we have to be honest about it with the American people, that we, they, we owe an obligation <laughs> to reasonably assess the threats, put together a national strategy, make sure that all the resources of federal, state, and local people are drawn to it. We all understand what it is. We properly fund it, not crazily fund it, and then uh, put it into place and, uh, and, and build this, and then uh, explain to the American people that, uh, the, that a life has never been risk-free and go on from there, and, and ask them to live free lives, Thank as you. they Dr. always Temple have. Uh, to come full circle, uh, again, uh, Congress has the, the responsibility of the purse uh, to provide the means. We can only spend them once. Congress also is uh, responsible for, for making war, uh, for declaring war. So uh, I think it's appropriate that Congress pass judgment on the strategy, which essentially is how we're going to go about dealing with this particular threat to our security. So what does this mean? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take off a number of things that I think Congress has to look for. One is. Do we have uh, an adequate statement of the character of the threat? Uh, is this a renegade group that we're talking about in terms of uh, international terrorism? Or is it a popular movement? If it's a popular movement, then it takes on the characteristics of an insurgency. An insurgency is a popular movement that has got a fundamental level of support uh, among a, a specific group of population. If this is a movement in the Arab world, for example, or in the Islamic world, then it's, it's not uh, essentially a police action. Uh, it's an action that at some point, if you're going to get rid of this brand of terrorism, you're going to have to go after the root causes of, of why these people are doing what they're doing. Uh, and it seems to me their objective is to get the uh, United States influence out of their part of the world and uh, in a sense almost to do the impossible to keep the Americans from exporting their culture, uh, to stop being Americans uh, in, in a sense. Uh, so what, what, what is the character of the threat that we're, we're dealing with? What is the goal? What do we wish to accomplish? What are the means? Uh, and again, your responsibility is to get a sense of, of whether the means can actually be provided. Are we willing to make that kind of a national commitment to X billions of dollars year after year after year? Because we know, as the President said, this is a protracted conflict which we are in. Um, methods, looking at strategy, preemption. preemption uh, strategists will tell you buys you time. When the Israelis bombed the Osiric reactor in 1981, they bought themselves time. What did they do with that time? That's got to be a critical part of your strategy. What are you going to do with the time you gain through preemption? Uh, metrics. Uh, again, how do we measure progress? Uh, not just in one area, but in a number of areas. And I think that's, uh, in a sense, why we have these multiple strategies, uh, because we ought to have performance metrics. But, but sir, don't you think and I'm cutting you off just a sure. little because of time, but don't, don't you think when Congress, uh, when all of America focuses like they did after 9-11, which is, we all agree was a focal point for us, um, and then we pass, we start debating, we all agree we need a homeland security something, and then we get hung up, and actually Congress goes home for Christmas, 
and everybody just takes time off while we discuss uh, civil service protections for people. Doesn't that really, and I, I'm not questioning the impact it has on individuals that are employed in the government, I, I'm not. But doesn't that really trivialize it for someone out there in Timbuktu, America, with respect to what it is, the sense of urgency we're trying to convince them we're dealing with? Well, and, and then we yeah. still haven't funded it. I, I mean, they're still out now. They're all screaming, where's the money? Where's the money? We told them we would give them the money. We're not giving them the money. What, I mean, doesn't this really fly in the face of what we call a sense of urgency? Well, I think certainly there, there needs to be a sense of urgency. Uh, one of the political wags uh, opined that uh, the situation is critical but not serious. And uh, in a sense, you could argue that we, we lack that Where sense. Where I come from, we call that a distinction without a difference. <laughs> but uh, if you, again, the years 1945 to 1950, when we developed the containment strategy, we were not at war. We were not being attacked. Uh, we did not have military forces engaged in combat. Uh, we certainly need that sense of urgency. Uh, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the question is, what is it going to take to get that sense of urgency? I think we a number of my have colleagues have talked about the, the importance of leadership. We don't have it, and we expect the public to give it. Unfortunately, we're privy to folks like you coming before us to give us information. But out in the hinterland, they, they don't get that. They get a, they'll get a snippet of this. They'll get a paragraph of this in some third rewrite of an AP story, which isn't, I mean, and I'm not being critical. I'm just saying it isn't fair to them in order for them to drive their politicians to make policy decisions. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, do you have any additional questions? Yeah, I just would like to uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the, the witnesses for their participation today, and particularly to thank you, um, uh, Governor Gilmore, because um, when we set this up, you could have um, asked for a separate panel. Uh, it would have uh, made it uh, not as interesting, and by your participating with the other three panels this way, it makes it uh, more informative, more educational. But I appreciate you not pulling rank like that. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you. And I'd like to thank the rest of you. Just a tremendous job. Thank you. I would like to thank the panelists also and ask if you have any additional comments or statements that you want uh, to be included in the record. We adjourn. Do each, any of you have any additional comments that you'd like to, to make for this hearing? I remain silent during this recent discussion, but it seems to me, rightly or wrongly, that there isn't any sense of prioritizing this enormous range of threat out there. I mean, the so-called threat from terrorism has a number of elements, and, uh, and there was discussion recent, a few minutes ago about uh, focusing the public, making the public more aware. It seems to me the public's attention has been, has been focused, but it's been focused on Iraq. And, and Iraq is, is a real threat, an ugly threat. The issue really, and it's debated, it's, it's a case to be made either way, but the case is whether it's an, it's an imminent threat. Or if it is an imminent threat, how imminent? Is it more imminent, say, than, 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 than the interrelated threat from Al Qaeda and the Arab-Israeli quarrel? Or, um, South, or, pa or Pakistan, the interaction between Pakistan and North Korea, the fact that this, this um, technology exchange between them could result in the North Koreans selling nuclear technology to this one and that one, anyone who's prepared to buy it. Uh, is it, is it also the case that while, while we are debating a lot of this, that is to say what to do about Iraq, that India, Pakistan will shoot, will shoot their way to the head of the agenda. I mean, so there's a lot to worry about, but I don't myself get any sense of prioritizing the range of threats. If no other members of the panel have any additional comments, uh, we thank you again and we'll be adjourned. Real honor to be up there with you, Governor.
For more information on U.S. policy towards Iraq, go to our homepage, cspan.org, and you'll see our special section dedicated to that topic, which features archival video, documents, and links to other related web areas. Again, for more on U.S. policy towards Iraq, 